welcome uh, to, to Fulbright Day here. I'm very glad that you all have an interest in the program, and now it's the uh, great time to start thinking about it, since the uh, competition for the coming year is going to be opening up on May 1st. We're very, very fortunate today to have a couple of representatives here from the Institute for International Education, which is the organization that administers the Fulbright uh, Grant Program, and to my left here is Walter Jackson. He is the director of the uh, U.S. Student Programs for IIE. And uh, to my right is uh, Andy uh, Reese. He is the Interim Director of Outreach and Communication, and he works with the Scholar and Professional Programs. So uh, I'd like to welcome them to the campus and uh, look forward to hearing about the program. Okay, Andy, come on, let's double team them. Uh, how, many, um, how many of you have been to the Fulbright U.S. Student Program website? Good. Uh, how many of you will be graduating um, this coming year? Okay. How many of you are graduate students? Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are going to be a graduating senior this year or you are, going, or you are a graduate student. Same application, same application process. Doesn't change. The Fulbright U.S. Student Program runs on a May, uh, May to October application cycle annual application cycle for grants attainable the following academic year award. One applies to Fulbright the year preceding the intended study or research time abroad. So this coming May 1st, the competition for the 2012-2013 academic year abroad opens. Uh, at that time, all the completed, updated penguins will be on our website. <laughs> Uh, the online application will be available. Uh, the process is totally done online. Okay. Um, let's talk about the deadlines. This year's application deadline, the national deadline, is October 17th at 5 p.m. But you are going to have an earlier deadline here at the university, which is September 9th, because you'll be submitting your application to us through your Campus Fulbright Program Advisor, through John. Uh, there is an, a campus interview uh, and an evaluation of your application prior to it coming to the, net, to the National Screening Committee in October, late October, okay? So that's the process. You apply through the university. The university is then going to submit that application to us for October 17th. So the deadline that you have to work with is sep September 9th, okay? By the way, if anybody has any questions, let's, let's ask them. I like questions, they create dialogue. Yes? Do you have to be going to school in order to apply to the Fulbright program? No. Okay. You do not have to be currently enrolled to be eligible. You do not have to be planning to return to school, to graduate school, to be eligible. Technically speaking, Eligibility is U.S. citizenship at the time of application and your bachelor's degree or its equivalent by the beginning date of the grant. Yes? So if I graduate from undergrad in a week, um, would I still be applying through U.S. even though I'm not current? You need to talk to your advisor about that to okay. find out if they work with alumni. You do. Good. Okay. You apply through the UF. Okay. Trust me. You want to go through the UF process because you have this infrastructure that's here, which is remarkable. You have all these people that are going to be working with you on your applications to make them successful. So you definitely want to work through the university's process. Because having that interview, part of that interview is then followed up by an evaluation, a written evaluation of that interview and your application. So it's like having, it's almost like having an additional recommendation in your application package. Okay. Yes? Does that include a permanent residence? No, you must be a U.S. citizen to be eligible. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, let me finish the deadline so you all, you'll all know about the de other deadlines. <coughs> September 9th, University of Florida campus deadline, October 17th, 5 p.m. on October 17th. You must make sure that your application is submitted to John by the deadline that he prescribes. 
must also make sure that it has been submitted electronically by October 17th. Got to make sure that it's in the system, in our online application system, um, by October 17th. Our National Screening Committee, which is comprised of over 300 leaders from uh, colleges and universities around the country, from the arts community, from the sciences, the professions, meets during November and December. And they make recommendations. They are not making selections. They are making recommendations to the Fulbright Commissions and the supervising agencies abroad. Um, the Fulbright program currently operates in 130 or 140 countries. It depends each year on who's talking to us. Um, and there are currently 50 Fulbright Commissions worldwide. In those countries where there are no Fulbright Commissions, the program is supervised locally out of the Public Affairs Office at the American Embassy. So the National Screening Committee meets during November and December to make recommendations to the Fulbright Commissions and program sponsors abroad. And they're recommending approximately two times the number of candidates as we anticipate there'll be grants available for. So if you go on our website and you look at the country summary for Italy and it says there are going to be 15 Fulbright grants, you can rest assured that the screening committee is going to be asked to nominate 30 people. There's a reason for this. It gives the Fulbright Commission, the host countries, a broader slate of candidates from which to choose. It also takes into account attrition. People will withdraw. And since the Fulbright program is funded by an annual appropriation from Congress to the Department of State, we're using federal funds, we don't like to send money back to the Treasury. We want to spend it. We want you out and about. So that over-nominating allows, also allows for alternate candidates to be selected, people who might be given an award should someone else decline. Okay. Country uh, selections take place in the country to which you have applied, and those occur during February to June. Everyone who applies gets an email from us at the end of January that will tell you whether or not you have been recommended. If you get an email from us that says you haven't been recommended, your application is no longer under consideration for this particular competition cycle. But that does not mean that you cannot reapply <coughs> next year. There's absolutely no prejudice in reapplication. People do it all the time. But if you do get an email from us that says you've been recommended, don't pack yet. Because remember, we're over-nominating. We're nominating more people uh, than there will be grants available for. So the selections will take place in the host country during February to June. Most people will hear in March, April, or May. But it can go until June. Okay. Simultaneously to the individual countries making their selections, those applications are also being reviewed by the Board of Foreign Scholarships in Washington, D.C. The Board of Foreign Scholarships, the J. William Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, is the policy-making body for the Fulbright. It's a presidentially appointed board, leaders from the education world, public leaders, people in, um, um, in business, appointed by the president. It's that body that has the final authority for the confirmation of selection. So it's really, really a three-tier review and selection process, review by the National Screening Committee, selection in the host country, review and confirmation of selection by the Board of Foreign Scholarships in Washington. If you're selected for a Fulbright grant, you would then begin the grant in conjunction with the academic year in the host country. What you cannot do is you cannot defer a Fulbright grant to a subsequent academic year. It's federally funded, so those, those funds must be used up within the fiscal year for which they were appropriated. All Fulbright student grants are written for a full academic year, which can vary anywhere from six months up to a calendar 12. The minimum amount of time that any Fulbright U.S. student program grant will be written for is six months, and that's only for people who are proposing a practical training in one of the creative and performing arts, or for individuals who are proposing dissertation research. All other degree levels or individuals that are applying for one of the English teaching assistantships must go for a full academic year. 
in the Fulbright US student program, you have to make a decision very early on. Do I want to apply for an English teaching assistantship, or do I want to apply for one of the traditional study or research awards? You cannot apply for both. It's one or the other. If you're applying for one of the English teaching assistantships, you're going to be teaching in a classroom, teaching English conversation in a classroom. So you will go in conjunction with the academic year. And you can find that information in the country summary sections on our website. Yes? It depends on the country. If you're doing, if you're doing so, solely doing research, there's a little bit more flexibility. Okay. But what you cannot do is defer it. Right. You can't defer the award. Right. If you're just doing research, there can be more flexibility. But there's a window within the academic cycle by which time you must take up your award. So if we're talking about the 2012-2013 competition cycle, that window is going to be September of 2012 through March of 2013. So somewhere in that window, if permissible by the country, you've got to take up your award in country. Okay. Any other questions before I lose my place again? Okay, so we decide very early on whether it's ETA or study research because we cannot apply for both. Applying for an English teaching assistantship, you apply to a specific country. You can only submit one application in any given competition <coughs> year. It's either English teaching assistantship or study or research. If it's English teaching assistantship, I must select an individual country and apply to that country. If I'm proposing study or research, the majority of you will have to then select a specific individual country. However, the opportunity does exist within the Fulbright US student program to propose a multi-country project. It's one project, one application, because we can only submit one application, but that one project requires my presence in up to three countries to complete. We have to be very careful about the countries that we select. Because this option is not available to all countries or in all world regions. Currently, multi-country projects will only be entertained in the Western Hemisphere world region, which is Central America, South America, and Canada, and in selected countries in Eastern Europe. You cannot cross world region boundaries in proposing a multi-country project, nor can you propose a multi-country project in Western Europe. Now, there's an exception to that last statement I just made. In the Fulbright program, as Andy will attest, at the scholar level and at the student level, there are lots of exceptions. Every rule has an exception. I could technically propose a multi-country project in Western Europe. But if I'm doing that, I would then have to be applying for one of the European Union awards. And I would have to be doing a project, a study or research project, that's applicable to the European Union program. Applicable to something that's doing study or research which is relevant to institution building in the EU. And then I could, and it's recommended that I do, propose going to more than one EU, EU state for my study or research. Yeah? Just to clarify, uh, if, you want, if you're interested in, say, studying Spain and Mexico, like uh, travel, you want not, to you can't travel. Do, not that travel. <coughs> but you could do Mexico and Venezuela. Sure. You could do Canada, Mexico, and Venezuela, because you're staying within the same world region. Or you could pick a couple of countries in Eastern Europe that are available. Okay. It's got to be within the same world region. If you have any question about whether or not a particular multi-country project will be entertained, get in touch with us before you file the application. Because our online application system will not give you an error message if you select incorrectly. 
Now, I've made a decision, I'm making my decision whether I want to apply for one of the English teaching assistantships or whether I want to apply for one of the traditional study or research awards. Well, what do I want to do? Well, I really don't know where I want to go. I don't have a study or research project. Well, then I might really want to look at one of the English teaching assistantships. Um, nice thing about the English teaching assistantships is I don't have to worry about setting up an affiliation. I don't have to worry about finding the institution, the organization, where I'm going to carry out my study research. They'll find it for me. Fulbright will find that affiliation for me. The nice thing about English teaching assistantships, and this is very applicable to graduating seniors, is that within the Fulbright <coughs> program, if your first Fulbright US student program grant is an English teaching assistantship, once two years have lapsed from the end of that English teaching assistantship, I become eligible to come back to the Fulbright program to apply for traditional study or research. But you cannot do it in the reverse. If your first Fulbright US student program grant, which is funded by the Department of State, is for traditional study or research, that's it. But that does not affect your eligibility for the Fulbright Hayes through the Department of Education. Two separate programs. The European Union program is traditional study or research. Um, you also have to be very careful about the country that you select if you're applying for one of the English teaching assistantships. It's, they're not available to all countries. There's currently only approximately 61, 62 countries which offer this particular component within their country plan. So you have to make sure that if you're applying for one of the English teaching assistantships, you apply to a country where it's available. Because once again, the online system will not give you an error message if you select incorrectly. Okay? Now I've decided that I'm going to apply for an English teaching assistantship. I don't have to worry about affiliation. Um, I'm another individual. I've decided that I want to apply for traditional study or research. Well, depending upon where I want to go and what what I want to do, I may or may not be responsible for finding my own affiliation, for finding that institution, that organization, that individual in the host country where I'm going to be working or with whom I'm going to be working. And it varies from country to country. When we're talking about traditional study or research in the Fulbright program and we talk about affiliation, that question has the potential for 140 different answers. Because we're dealing with 140 different countries. And what might be applicable in Germany is not going to be applicable in Botswana. What might, be, what might work in the UK is not necessarily going to work in Peru. Contained in each one of the individual country summaries on our website, will be a section on affiliation. And it will talk about whether or not I, as the applicant, am I responsible for securing it, or will it be secured for me? Do I have to have the letter at the time that I apply? Or is it something that I can get after being selected? It varies from country to country. Once again, if you have any questions about affiliation, you can go on our website and go to the bottom of the page, and at the bottom of every page on our website, you'll find a Contact Us link. Um, and in that Contact Us link are the names, telephone numbers, and email addresses of all of the uh, World Region Program Managers at IIE in New York. And they would welcome either an email or a telephone call from you you'll find that we are very user friendly. We've got a deal going on here. If you guys don't apply, I don't have a job. <laughs> so let's work together on this, okay? <laughs> right? So we welcome the opportunity to answer your questions. I think your first point of contact is always your Fulbright Program Advisor. If it's something which is terribly country specific, come to us in New York, email or pick up the phone and call of the country program manager. More than glad to answer your question. Okay. 
Now, as I said, the, the competition officially opened on May 1st. At that point in time, the online application system will be, will be open. It will be available. You can go in, and you'll find it in the Apply Now section on our website. You create your own account. Um, you can go in and out of the online application system between May and September 9th. You don't have to complete it all in one sitting. While you're working on your application, no one can see it. You have control of it. You have ownership. The only time that anyone can review it is once you submit it electronically, and then it goes to your Fulbright Program Advisor. You don't see it yet. So don't worry about, I hit the Submit button, it's, coming, it's going to the Fulbright Office in New York. Don't worry about it. It's going to your Fulbright Program Advisor. Okay? And you want to talk to him about how they choose to submit applications electronically. Institutions have varying times when they want to. An application consists of all the basic bio data that all applications consist of. Consists of a statement of grand purpose, which is the what, where, why, when, and how of what I want to do. If I'm applying for an English teaching assistantship, that statement of grand purpose is one page. If I'm applying for one of the traditional study or research awards, that statement of grant purpose is two pages. In both instances, it is in a type that is legible to the human eye. <laughs> okay, so absolute minimum 10 point. Absolute minimum 10 point. We recommend 12, but I have to tell you the truth, no one's going to be sitting in New York with a pipe of hole. To see if you, came, if, you, if you came in at 10 or 11 or 12. All right. Um, it also, for all applicants, a one-page personal statement, which is much more than a CV. It's much more than a resume. Um, it's really a personal essay about who you are as an individual, an intellectual biography and narrative form, if you will. Okay. It's important to remember that the Fulbright program is more than an educational exchange program. It's an educational and a cultural exchange. It has a very strong cultural component. It uses educational activities to enhance the cultural component of the program. So yes, indeed, we're looking for individuals who are proposing very interesting study or research projects, because you can propose to follow a course of study at a university. You can do independent research. You can do a combination of the two. I can propose to go abroad to paint in Italy perfectly legitimate the Fulbright student program. Okay. Or I can propose to be that English teaching assistantship, one or the other. But in addition, we're also looking for people that are going to be cultural ambassadors, citizen ambassadors, if you will, for the United States and the Fulbright program. The intent of the Fulbright program is to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. And one of the ways that we can contribute to getting to know one another is to communicate. So language is very important in the Fulbright program. And your ability to be an effective communicator or citizen ambassador for the Fulbright program should you be selected. So for countries where English is not the national language, and that's most countries in the world, we expect you, at a minimum, <coughs> to have a hospitality level in the national language of that country, so you can be that effective communicator for the Fulbright program, that effective citizen ambassador. If you are proposing to study your research project that requires a certain level of language, well, we're going to expect that you have that. If the country that you're applying to has a very specific language requirement, and once again, you will find that contained in the individual country summary, we're going to expect <coughs> that you have that particular level of proficiency. So language is important in the Fulbright program. And as part of the application, you're going to submit a foreign language evaluation, which must be completed by a college or university language teacher or a professional language teacher. They need to interview you. 
They need to test you, and then they need to complete the evaluation telling us what level you are in the language of that country, or what level you are in the language related to your project. So language is very important in the Fulbright program. So there's foreign language evaluation in the application packet. Three letters of recommendation. Best advice I can give you about letters of recommendation in the Fulbright program is don't just look at the instructions we give you on our website. Look at the instructions that we're giving to the people who are going to be writing your letters of recommendation. A letter of recommendation in the Fulbright program is more than, I know Walter, he's a nice guy. Well, we all know Walter's a nice guy. Mm. All right? But it's, I know Walter, he's a nice guy. This is how well he is prepared academically to carry out this project. This is how important the resources are in the country that he's applying to to carry out the project. This is how important this Fulbright experience is to Walter's future academic, professional, artistic development. This is what Walter is going to bring to the Fulbright program. This is how Walter is going to be that effective citizen ambassador. So the individuals that are writing your letters of recommendation need to know you. Okay, so you have to choose them wisely. I think it's an excellent idea to very early on in the process just have a sit down with your campus Fulbright program advisor and say, you know, these are the three people that I've chosen to write my letters of recommendation and why I think they would be good advocates for me in this process. Okay. Foreign language evaluations and letters of recommendation are requested and submitted using the online application system. Everything is electronic. Okay. And very similar to yours, they have to be requested and no noted in two places in the, in the system. Okay. Uh, we also need transcripts from all institutions attended, which you get. You can get on official transcripts and scan and upload them. If you're a graduate student, we need both your undergraduate and your graduate record. Okay. Everything is pretty much laid out. Um, if you go to the preparing an application section on our website, it's really rather neat. It will. It will take the application apart bit by bit. It'll talk about the statement of, the statement of uh, grant purpose for study or research. It'll talk about the statement of grant purpose for someone who's applying for an English teaching assistantship or for someone who's applying in one of the creative or performing arts. Are there any artists in the room? Oh, good, I love artists. One of, one, of, one of the things that I'm charged with during the course of the, the whole review process is coordinating all of the, um, all of the uh, review committees in the creative and performing arts. What's unique to artists is that in addition to the written application, you're also submitting work samples. And there's some very specific instructions as to, by discipline, the type of work samples that you submit, either in CD format, DVD format, or in so follow those instructions. Very important. Applications in the arts are screened by discipline. There are currently 18 different committees in the creative and performing arts. This is unique for painting, sculpture, dance, performance art, wind instruments, string instruments. I mean, there's 18 different committees. And they are reviewed by professionals in those particular disciplines. So if you're, if you're a painter, your application is going to go to the painting committee. These are people that are either professional painters, teach painting at the college or university level, in the arts, the first things that the committees do is look at or listen to the material, because they're looking at applications worldwide. And a lot of their decision to recommend is based solely on the quality of the work. They're looking for talent, they're looking for potential. Okay. But you will find very specific instructions on the website. Do you have a question? sense that you will be submitting samples of your writing. Ten pages, double spaced, and it's 
type that is legible to the human eye. Okay? And in support of what I'm proposing to do, if I'm proposing to go and do research for a novel, then one would want to see prose. If I want to go do research for poetry, then one would submit poetry. Um, but the supplementary material in the arts should, should, should support what I'm proposing to do on my program. Right. Um, so that preparing an application section is, is really kind of neat because it will just literally pull the application apart and talk about all of the individual components. There's a whole section on affiliation for those of you that are applying for traditional study or research. It talks about what affiliation is, how one documents that. By the way, documentation of affiliations comes in the form of a letter, a hard copy letter on the letterhead with a signature. I don't care how you get it. They can fax it to you. They can attach it as a PDF and email it to you. But a simple email that says, yeah, you can come here, we'll work with you, is not sufficient. It needs to be something a little bit more official. Okay. Um, there's a section on writing a statement if I'm an English teaching assistantship. If I apply for one of the English teaching assistantships, yes? Yeah. If you're under a federal fellowship that says that you cannot receive another federal, federal money, can you still apply? <coughs> This is a federal government fellowship, yes. That's what I would, yeah. I don't know what other, so the, the do you have a Pell Grant? No, I have a, it's a NASA fellowship. A it's NASA the, fellowship? Yeah. So they, they say I cannot do another federal, I cannot have another federal fellowship. I don't know, do you? Well, typically, if they set the rule that you can't do it, then you can't yeah. do it. Oh, From the Fulbright point of view, From our point of view, I don't know what the problem would be. Well, you, you guys are, are you, you still are uh, federal. Federally funded, yes. Federal, yeah. yeah. So it's a federal grant. Yeah. Yes? I was told a few years back that you couldn't go do research or, or get funded for research through Fulbright if you had if you were born in the country that you wanted to go, or if you had studied there before, is that correct? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, dual citizenship is usually not a problem, but it can be. It is never a problem if I'm not applying to a country to which I hold dual citizenship. So if I have it, uh, Hungarian and U.S. dual citizenship, if I'm applying to Italy, it's not an issue. It becomes an issue if I hold dual Hungarian U.S. citizenship and I'm applying to Hungary. And that's not a Fulbright policy, that's a Hungarian government policy. Because the Hungarians first are, are going to identify, are going to consider you their citizen. In which case they're not going to give you all the necessary visas in your U.S. passport to enter the country. So that's where it becomes an issue. It's not a Fulbright policy. It's a policy of the host country government. If dual citizenship is an issue, once again, if you go to one of the um, individual country summaries, it's noted there. Mm -hmm. It'll be noted in that individual country summary. So being born in a country, if you don't hold dual citizenship, not an issue. The only time that experience in a country can affect the application, and it's not an eligibility issue, it's more of a preference factor, is if you have had extended opportunity to study or research in that country at the graduate level in the, proceed, in the year preceding application, six months or more, then it becomes an issue. In the year preceding? In the year preceding. Okay. At the graduate level. If it was a study abroad program, undergraduate study abroad, don't even worry about it. It, it, it has absolutely no effect. Okay? Let's see. Let's see. Is there anyone here with any Croatian ancestry who's 
thinking about applying to Croatia. Oh, I'm kidding, I have such a good story. <laughs> but I'll tell it to you anyway. <laughs> There's that section on factors affecting eligibility. I'm hungry. If dual citizenship is an issue, we'll let you know about it really early on in the process. Well, the Croatian story. Um, you might not necessarily hold dual citizenship with Croatia, but if you had any Croatian family history, if great grandma was Croatian and came to the United States, the Croatian government still considers you their citizen. And as a result, if you travel to Croatia, even on a Fulbright grant, the Croatian government can conscript you into their armed services because you're a very <laughs> So dual citizenship can be an issue. In which case, if it is, we let you know. Okay? Um, yes? Yes? Six weeks? I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, six fine. weeks. Six that's not. A, that's anything. not. That's not so an intense months, cultural it's experience. If it's six months or more, okay. really, and it's an it's not an eligibility issue. People get hung up on this all the time. They they read it and they think, oh my God, I'm ineligible. It's not an eligibility issue. It's a preference factor. Okay. Um, and I mean, if we're going, to, I'll be perfectly candid with you. Most of the people that apply for a Fulbright award have had an international experience. It's one of the things that brings them to the Fulbright program. You know, um, and you really can't, uh, I can't give you a cut and dried answer to that question because it is a preference factor. You cannot take an individual application out of the country competition in which it was reviewed because you're comparing everybody who's applying to that particular country in any given competition. And you're making decisions based on the information that you now, program policy says you give preference to people who haven't had the opportunity for extended study or research abroad. So if I'm looking at two applications, and they are equal in all ways, but one person has been abroad last year for seven months, and the other in the country to which they're applying, and the other person has not, who do I pick? Program policy says I give preference to the person who has to give it. But the overriding criteria in the Fulbright program, provided that there are no eligibility issues, is to select the best qualified people. Yes? Is that in reference to research abroad or to university? It's a program wide policy. Okay, and so when you say six months or more, how do you do research? Is, for example, study or research or mimic? Any sort of six months or more, any sort of intense experience in the country to which I'm applying. Okay, so what are, so it was in fact English, but not through, so obviously that was for two years. Right. That, that would be exactly. Exactly. So it's not studying research. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is apply to another country. Don't apply to the same country where I was doing that English mm -hmm. Even if it's within the same world region, <laughs> it's still not going to have that decision, that, that sort of effect on it. Yes? If there's a U.S. government travel <coughs> advisory towards a specific country, is that going to affect whether you can apply to the Fulbright in particular? If the country is listed on our website, we will entertain the application. Okay. Now, whether or not one ultimately goes is another issue, and it depends on the level of the travel warning and the security conditions within the host country and where we are. Um, one of the one of the nice things about our online application system is that uh, while we and as I said this earlier, uh, we cannot see we can't see your application while you're working on it. We cannot see until it actually comes to us from the university. We can still see if someone's applying to a particular country. And let's say during the course somewhere over that May to October 
cycle, a particular country um, is deemed as um, a security risk and we don't want to send people um, to that particular country. The first place we're going to put it in the, is on our website homepage in the program updates. We're going to send an email out to all of our Fulbright program advisors with the country information update. And then we're going to go into the online application system and we're going to say, okay, filter it by everyone that's applying to this country where we can, can no longer accept applications and we'll send all of those people an email that says, unfortunately, this particular program has now been suspended. You may want to consider applying to another country. So if we have gone through the process and you have already been selected, well, then it's handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay? Um, one of the things I think you might want to take a look at, which is a really sort of nifty resource, is uh, the directories for the directory of previous uh, Fulbrighters. It goes back to 93, and we're now in the process of getting all the 2010 people um, in the directory. But you can search by, you can search by field of study. Uh, you can search by field of study and then country visited. So let's say I'm in public health. Well, I can search public health and a particular year or a cluster of years and bring up everyone from 1993 who received a Fulbright grant in public health and it'll tell me where they went and it'll give me a brief description of their project. Or if I'm particularly interested in the country, I can pull up a country and that will give me the list of everyone since 1993 who received a Fulbright grant to that particular country and in, any, in, in all fields. And then again, a brief description of the project. So it's a, it's kind of a neat uh, a neat resource to take a look at because it will actually show you how broad the Fulbright program is as far as the types of grants, the types of people that are ultimately selected for grants. Um, there virtually are no fields of study that will not be entertained in the Fulbright U.S. Student the only time that a particular field of study can be an issue is if within that individual country summary, it's listed as a non-recommended field of study. Uh, at that point, uh, don't just throw your hands up and say Fulbright won't consider the application. Get in touch with us. Um, get in touch with one of those program managers for the country and the world region, see if it might be entertained. There is the possibility that it might be identified as a non-recommended field of study because of placement possibilities or affil affiliation possibilities. But if you can find your own affiliation, uh, we might be able to entertain the application. On the other hand, it might also be a real issue. I mean, if I'm applying to do some sort of research into land reform in Zimbabwe, we're going to have a problem <laughs> because it's a touchy topic. You know? um, so there are some non-recommended fields which are there very specifically be because of their political or social or cultural sensitivity in those particular countries. Yes? Um, I understand there's, there's limits to what you can study in the medical fields. Um, for instance, if something's in a clinical setting there, um, it's not recommended to apply. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it depends on what one is proposing to do. We cannot accept an application where the research requires a nursing or a medical license. We're going to be working with patients in an atmosphere where a license is required. I'm checking with Andy because we just, this is brand new, what, this past year, right? Well, actually, the scholar program has done it a little longer, but anything that involves human experimentation is pretty much off the books. You can be <laughs> present while somebody else is doing it as licensed. You cannot do it. Okay. That's okay. Right. Now, what the Fulbright Student Program does not require is IRB approval. The Fulbright Program won't require it, but your degree granting institution probably will. It depends on what you choose to use that research for. 
So you have to be very careful about that. Yes? To what degree is a multidisciplinary focus encouraged? It's neither encouraged nor discouraged. Okay, so if you Perfectly want to do some sort of ethnographic field research from a psychological perspective. That That's fine. Um, also, with, with before I forget, um, the resources for applicants. Um, if you find somebody who went to your particular country and in your particular field, get in touch with them. Talk to them. Uh, now, we won't give you their names or contact information, but you didn't hear this from me. Google them. <laughs> Everybody has a Facebook page. Or, what you can also do is check out the alumni ambassadors. There are these are a series, a group of um, people from the previous year who've had Fulbright awards, who have been recruited. Yeah, the scholar group, yeah, who have been recruited and have agreed to work with us uh, in talking to and working with applicants. Now they're not going to critique your projects, but they certainly can give you guidance on the process and what it's like. Let me also suggest that on the scholar pages, uh, our alumni list go back to <coughs> 1989, so obviously it's a better program. Uh, but <laughs> these are also people that you'll find no, listed you're by, anal. by <laughs> I didn't think it showed in this jacket. Uh, <laughs> you know, these are also people you can search by uh, host country institution and by discipline, both visiting scholars and American scholars. Talk to them as well because it may be that you won't find a student who happens to have worked there in your field, but you'll find a scholar who's been there. They're also going to know some things, and they may be able to help you, to help direct you to someone appropriate, or at least tell you, no, you really don't want to go here. You know, it's just a, that it doesn't work right, try someplace else, whatever. So be sure to use all the resources that Apple Bright offers to you. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's a wealth of, of, of information out there, and there are an awful lot of people that are going to be more than happy to help you. Um, Fulbright's kind of a really big family, you know. Um, check out the multimedia section on our website. Uh, if you're going into the process, uh, subscribe to the applicant blog. Uh, it's really neat. During the course of our May to October cycle, we send out uh, blogs and we focus on different um, aspects of the application process. Things you should be thinking about, how to select recommenders, how to go about finding affiliation. Uh, we do a series of webinars, podcasts. Um, they're ultimately archived on our site. Uh, the webinars, you're free to, to register and sign in. Uh, they are hosted by our World Region Program Managers. I showed you their contact list a little bit earlier. It's an opportunity to ask questions of them specifically take advantage of that. Um, check out our Twitter page, Facebook page. Um, on a lot of the individual country summary pages, and in those countries where there are Fulbright commissions, There are video interviews with the directors of the Fulbright Commissions. And they're talking about they're talking about the types of students they select for awards, what they look for in student applications. And this is from the person who's the executive director of the Fulbright Commission in country where selection takes place. interview with Dr. Hoffman, who's the director of the Fulbright Commission in Berlin. I'd certainly take his points to heart if I was applying to Germany. Um, there are a number of interviews on the country pages where there are no Fulbright Commissions with previous
Fulbright Run Tees, talking about how, what the process was like. Um, lots of, there are a lot, there's a lot of information there. Um, and I just want to, when's our panel at four? Um, I just want to have a few minutes to wrap up. Um, one of the things that I that I that I really want to impress upon you is before you before you go in and start working on that application, go through the program overview. Be very familiar with the information contained in the individual country summary for the country to which you're applying. Go through preparing an application. Go through that section. It's going to be amazingly helpful. It's really going to demystify the process. It really is. Uh, then go to apply now and start working on your application. And do me one more favor. Read the instructions. Please. Everything that you put into that application is ultimately going to be uploaded once you have submitted it, submitted it into a database. And it's from that database that we're going to create all of the information that we need to share that application with the members of the National Screening Committee here in the United States, the Fulbright Commission, the American Embassies, the Board of Foreign Scholarship, in the review and selection of your application. So whatever you put in there is going to follow that path. One of the things that we're also charged with in this particular program is because, as I said very early on, the Fulbright program is funded by an annual appropriation from the Congress to the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department. One of the things that we are charged with is informing Congress each year of who was selected for a Fulbright Award. We have to let every congressman know who in their district was selected. We have to know, let every senator know who in their state was selected. And that information has to be forwarded to Congress. I don't know if any of you have dealt with Congress. <laughs> but they can be very persnickety about the way you present in, uh, data to them. Uh, they don't like abbreviations. So if you live on a street, you live on a street. You don't live on a st <laughs> Okay. So take a look at the instructions for entering data into the system and follow them. Um, if we give you a suggestion, take it. Uh, one of the suggestions that we give you is don't enter your, your essays into the system manually. Create them as separate Word documents and then upload them when you're totally satisfied. There's a reason why we're giving you that hint. Uh, number one, it allows you to select your font, your type size, as long as it's legible to the human eye, remember. Uh, it allows you to bold, italicize, use diacritical marks if necessary. Entering the... Um, the essays manually into the system, you're stuck with our formatting. It doesn't give you that flexibility. It's also nice to share them early on. Those two essays are very important bits of information that should be shared with your Fulbright program advisor as well as the individuals or the institutions where you may want to work with a while. So you'll find lots of hints in the system throughout and suggestions for ways to make it work better for you. So really go through that preparing an application section. And by all means, if you have any questions about anything in the process, get in touch with your Fulbright program advisor or get in touch with the country program manager at IIB in New York. Either email them or pick up the phone and call them, whichever you prefer. Um, we like talking with you. We really do. Um, it's probably the most interesting part of our jobs. We spend an awful lot of time moving things around electronically it's really nice to talk with a human being. You know, it really, and you never cease to amaze us um, as far as, as, as the creativity. You're gonna do what? Where? You know, it's, it's exciting. So, I mean, we would like to share in that excitement with you, uh, and we would like to encourage you, if it's not this year or next year, to think about Fulbright. It will change your life, and it will make you part of the family that you will learn to love dearly throughout the rest of your academic or professional careers. So I wish you all good luck. And when you get selected, Godspeed. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm from CIS in Washington. 
I'm the currently I'm the interim director of outreach. I have to try to remember what my title is. It changes like every three days, uh, and so I can't even keep my business cards up to date uh, for the Fulbright Scholar Program. Uh, we've been having some interesting moments of panic because the special um, PowerPoint that I did for the University of Florida, we can't find. So we've got a general PowerPoint that's going to work just fine. But it doesn't have some slides that I can done specifically for Florida, and I'll be glad to send those once I find the, the actual uh, uh, presentation. I'll be glad to share it with everybody. But it's just about the numbers of full writers who come from Florida through the faculty program in the last five years, and I believe it was 31 uh, American scholars who have gone overseas from the University of Florida since the 2005-2006 academic year, and that's a very nice number, uh, going to some 20-something countries in virtually every part of the world, so Florida's been very active in the program. Uh, and as I was um, being so impressed this morning by the facilities here on the University of Florida campus, uh, and I have said and will continue to say, and I will say in other places, uh, you were very fortunate because you have a tremendously supportive culture here, uh, an administration that recognizes the value of lots of opportunities, not just Fulbright. And so you're very lucky because I can assure you there are plenty of campuses around this country where that's not the case. Uh, so take advantage of it. Uh, and I'm here to tell you very quickly, uh, if that's possible, either for me or for the Fulbright program, about uh, the Fulbright Program for American Scholars, basically. That's what I'm going to talk about. And um, how you apply for one, and hopefully how you are successful for one. That's the purpose of our being here. This is my exceptional colleague, Walter Jackson. And I do use the term exceptional in all of its meaning. Uh, he's here from the Institute of International Education, with which CIS is affiliated. And Walter takes care of American student programs through Fulbright. And so he's going to be doing the presentation later about the student program. Uh, but we've decided to tag team you all day long so that you can ask questions back and forth. And uh, we'd like you know, to get as many questions as possible to help you figure out how you fit into the Fulbright program, what the options are, et cetera. Uh, so welcome today, and thank you very much for coming. This is the Fulbright logo. Uh, if you go into Fulbright, uh, you will see this frequently. It's blue and white. And thank you very much. Uh, this is because, uh, this is actually supposed to be orange. Uh, we paid a lot of money to have an orange strip put on our stuff. This is CIES, so please be respectful of orange. I know it has a meaning here as well. Uh, so we, we obviously have an interface that other people would have never suspected. Uh, my PhD is in Russian history, so I always do an outline. And it's basically, I'm going to talk about the program, and then we'll have questions, and I probably won't get to the end of it, so I'll tell you that right now. But that's why I'm in a hurry. Um, and remember also that Fulbright goes in both directions. It sends American scholars overseas every year through the core program about, uh, the core program is what we now call the original Fulbright program, the one that was begun in 1947 actually, in terms of active uh, exchange of people. Uh, the core program runs typically from two to 12 month opportunities depending upon a particular award, a particular country, etc. Um, and that program represents more than 800 American scholars every year going overseas and more than 800 visiting scholars coming to the United States. And in that period I was telling you about with the University of Florida, uh, you've had, I believe it was 30 visiting scholars coming to the campus here uh, as well. So you've also been very active and almost evenly balanced in terms of the number of American scholars going overseas, the number of visiting scholars coming here. Uh, and I was interested to note that uh, in particular, it seemed that Argentina was a very popular source of visiting scholars to the University of Florida. There were, I believe, five or six during that period. But anyway, the program runs in both directions. It's not an exact exchange in the sense of, uh, I have to find somebody to come from Brazil to take my place, and then I'll go to Brazil to take theirs. That's actually the way, the way the teacher program, which works with primary and secondary education, has tended to work. Uh, if it turns out that you go to an institution and that institution sends a scholar to the University of Florida, that's a happy accident. Uh, people apply individually to do individual kinds of things. And what I should also tell you is a quick vocabulary lesson for Fulbright. Uh, we put out an award catalog every year. For us, award means opportunity. Awards are designed in the hosting country. And so a, an award means 
this is an opportunity that we've identified that we would like to have an American scholar or a group of Amer a number of American scholars to take up. A grant is the money. So people sometimes get confused between awards and grants. So awards are opportunities. The award catalog that we put out, the various awards that we advertise, are opportunities for you to apply in order to get a grant. So we just mentioned that for your quick vocabulary lesson. That's as complicated as it will get, I swear to you. Uh, this is Senator J. William Fulbright, if you can see through me, etc. I don't know quite where to stand, I never do. Uh, Senator Fulbright was a real person. He was uh, the youngest university president in America when he was the president of the University of Arkansas in his youth. He then ran for the House of Representatives and stayed there for one term and then ran for the American Senate where he spent the majority, or rather the rest of his active political career. He was the longest serving head of the, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in American history. Uh, and he's probably best known to historians for his rather um, dynamic relationship with President Johnson, a, a southern gentleman from a neighboring state of Texas. Uh, they had some rather serious disagreements about Vietnam, and they became very famous for the ongoing catfight that was, uh, went on in Washington. But I was fortunate, I've been with uh, Fulbright now for almost 23 years, to have met him actually uh, prior to his death. And I think I can say with complete confidence that the thing he was most proud of was the Fulbright program because he felt that he had made a real contribution to America and to the world in the process of doing this program. So it was created in 1946, the end of the Second World War. Uh, the idea essentially being that Americans didn't know very much about the world, and they'd gone through the First World War, and then they got caught up in the Second World War, and it was, everybody thought, well, the Third World War is right around the corner because Joe Stalin is messing with atomic bombs, and Mao Zedong is about to take over China, and oh, Lordy, what are we going to do? And actually, the Fulbright program was one of the very first strategic options that America took. The idea being that Americans needed to understand the world better, the world needed to see Americans as not having tanks and guns all the time, uh, that America had been protected by you know, the oceans and isolation and all that kind of wonderful stuff and it hadn't worked. And so as, as turning out to be a leading power in the world, we needed to have a better idea about what the world was about. And it, the concept was that by studying and learning together, you actually get to know each other better. Uh, and that uh, Fulbright programs initially were intended to be relatively long in the sense that it was not about academic tourism. It was about going someplace and staying there for a little while so that you got to know the people there, you got to understand the customs better, the cultures, etc. They got to understand you on the rather simple, and I always refer to this as the sort of Miss America part of the presentation, the fairly simple premise that you can build peace by understanding people better. And that has always been a founding principle of the Fulbright program, and it always will be. People to people diplomacy produces positive results. It not only endorses academic uh, excellence, but it also builds relationships between nations. And that's what Fulbright's all about, uh, when you boil it all down. So it goes in both directions, as I've already mentioned. We send American scholars and professionals overseas every year. We receive visiting scholars and professionals in the United States. They teach and conduct research. Uh, and uh, this is uh, money, most of it is American taxpayer money. It comes to us out of the Congress of the United States, through the United States Department of State, through their Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And if you should apply for a Fulbright or become involved in Fulbright, you will hear ECA being brought up all the time, and that's Educational and Cultural Affairs. Those are our colleagues and our partners at the State Department. Uh, the scholar program is administered by us at CIES. We were created in 1946, and we were created to administer this program. And we just put in a rebid for the next seven years, which we, since it was a 900-page document, if anybody could ever get through it, we're really hoping that we'll convince everybody that we know what we're doing, and we'll have a contract, and I'll have a job, thank you very much, uh, for the next seven years. Uh, and so that's basically the simple piece. We are affiliated now with the Institute of International Education, which is headquartered in New York, where the student program is administered. Uh, so those are the basic administrative processes that you need to know about. If anything is simple, that's relatively simple. So what do you have to do to be eligible for the Fulbright program? The eligibility factors are relatively simple. First of all, you have to be an, an American citizen. You cannot be a green card holder and be a, an American Fulbrighter. You have to apply in the country of your citizenship. Interestingly enough, there are countries abroad that send what are the equivalent of green card holders to the United States through the Fulbright program. 
they can do that. That's within their purview. But under the American law, you must be an American citizen. One of the reasons I believe why this is done, and maybe I'm making this all up, but I like to think of us you know, having good reasons for doing things, uh, is that if you should be interested in applying for, uh, to become a citizen, and you take a Fulbright grant and go overseas for something like a year, it blows the whole process of application for citizenship. You have to start all over again, because you're not supposed to be out of the country for that long. So I like to think that the reason why this is, has remained a, uh, a basic qualification for the program is simply that we are protecting your options if you choose to become a United States citizen. Anyway, to be an American applicant, you must be an American citizen. You don't have to wait any time after you become a citizen. So if you become a citizen, you are eligible to apply immediately to be a Fulbrighter, but you must be a citizen. The other issue is the degree issue, and this is a an interesting issue because, as I explained earlier in the day here, the devil with Fulbright is always in the details of the specific country. What is a country looking for? Because each and every one of our programs is designed in the hosting country. It is not designed in Washington. It is not designed in New York. The hosting country says this is what we're interested in, and sometimes those decisions are a little bizarre, I will admit, and we sometimes have some very interesting conversations saying, are you serious? Uh, but the decision is theirs, and so this is what they have asked us to try to find people to do in terms of both student and scholar programs. And so sometimes the issue of what exactly is the degree that is necessary or is acceptable will be a debatable one, depending upon the country. Oftentimes it is, I mean, it's the simplest thing to do is to have a PhD. That's, that makes it very simple, because you've got the basic uh, ter what we refer to in very in elegant uh, English, terminal degree in hand at time of, of application. So you're terminal when you apply for full right? I know that makes you feel very good. Um, but there are lots of programs that do not have PhDs, for instance. Social work typically does not have a PhD. Uh, Ireland did a wonderful thing when I, was, when I was running that program. They put in an award in culinary arts. Great idea. Great idea. Requirement, PhD in culinary arts. So I wrote them and I said, um, if you can name a program that has a PhD in culinary arts, I will eat it. Uh, and they couldn't, but they kept the award in for two years and interestingly enough, nobody ever applied uh, because they didn't meet the requirements. It was, these things happen occasionally. It's not typical, but they do happen. So anyway, uh, there are lots of fields where what the terminal degree is is debatable potentially. Also, as we know, there are a lot of people who have professional careers. Uh, in business, in the State Department, in all kinds of places. And they make up the difference between what might be a terminal degree uh, that they don't have with the fact that they have lots of experience. And as we know, there are lots of faculty positions that go to people who have a lot of professional experience who may not have a terminal degree per se and yet make up the difference and become faculty members, etc., because they have skills and experience that they had gained through real life work. So my basic issue on this is if you have a question about does my degree status fit with Fulbright, especially Fulbright in country X, contact our program staff. You will find that in our award catalog, remember awards opportunity, in our award catalog, every country identifies a particular group of people who work with that country. It's their phone numbers and their email addresses. Contact them. It's why they're there. There's nothing immoral about that. I get asked this question all the time. Oh, should I contact program staff? Isn't that cheating somehow? No. If you've got a question, ask it. And so if you're ever concerned about, do I fit this award? Would this country be, you know, be ready to accept this? Ask the question. I did lots of research as in those 18 plus years as a program officer to ask questions about, well, if this happens, could that happen? And so on and so forth. So I often took over that process to find out. The worst answer you'll ever get is no. And we don't keep track of no's. Uh-oh, look who's trying to apply again. Tell her no what. That's not how it works. So if you have a question, ask it. We will try to get you an answer. Or we may know it right off the top of our hats. And some countries, frankly, are very uh, credentially oriented. Uh, and quite frankly, one of the interesting things is, and I think I realize this is uh, well, maybe we best use the term developing world. 
I never quite know what the current term is when you apply, when you talk about countries outside of Europe or you know, parts of Asia, et cetera. But anyway, sometimes countries in the developing world are the most sensitive about uh, degree issues, about credential issues, because they feel that if they're not getting this level, then they are somehow being demeaned. And yet often it's like, no, this is exactly the person that you want. This is the person who can do the job that you are asking to have done. But anyway, ask the question if you're ever concerned. Uh, if you're an artist, for instance, very few people have PhDs in fields of art because they don't exist. And the story I always tell, and I'm about to tell it again, so get ready, uh, is about the woman who did ballet, who was on the faculty of a major university in the United States. She had a high school degree, and she had you know, a pile of uh, achievements this thick, and she was a faculty member. And she got a grant, she went to Russia, she went to what was the old Imperial Ballet School in St. Petersburg. She taught modern dance. She studied classical ballet while she was there. She was a phenomenal hit, a huge success. She's now the chair of the department at her major American university. She still has a high school degree, but she also has a Fulbright. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that was just fine because it fit with what she was trying to do. So ask the question if you're not sure. Some awards will have teaching experience built in. They will say you must have five years as a such and such. And I'm sure we don't have any such and suches here. But anyway, the idea is if you find that, and it's a very unusual requirement now, it's much more common when I first started a long time ago, if you find that requirement, it's probably something that they really are interested in. But you can still ask the question, so do. If you're concerned, I'm at four and a half years or whatever the heck it is, ask the question. And we now have limits to prior Fulbright experience. Uh, the, these limitations are set by the J. William Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, which is the presidentially appointed oversight board for all Fulbright programs. And several years ago, they ruled that in a lifetime, through the scholar program, you can have two Fulbright grants. This was not the case previously. It can be figured one of two ways. You can have two of the core grants, those two to 12 month grants. Or you can have one of those in two of our shorter grants. That's the Specialist Program, the International Educational Administrators Program, the Nexus Program, and the IEA, International Educational Administrator Program. Now the interesting thing about that is that the, uh, say the, uh, well the Specialist Program can be as short as two weeks. So you could have two two week grants and that would be the equivalent of a 12 month grant. We find this math somewhat disturbing. Uh, however, it's the current rule. And of course, there's an exception that I can now announce. Uh, starting last year through next year, if you have used up your eligibility, you can still apply for either Pakistan or Indonesia, and you don't have to worry about having used up your eligibility. <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, so anyway, those are, those are the rules. So they're really fairly, fairly simple. Uh, you know, I can't have a Fulbright program because I'm not fluent in a foreign language. Well, surprise, surprise. That's not necessarily important. <laughs> many, many of our teaching grants are for teaching in English. The reason being, uh, basically, that you know, this is the language of American English in particular, so we've gotten past the chemist and the turbo and all that sort of stuff, and we've now gone to the trunk and the drugstore, uh, that American English has become the lingua franca of the world. It's what movies are in, conferences are in, publications are in, uh, and I guess I should drag her out again. It's what Lady Gaga sings in, so on and so forth. So, I mean, all the important stuff that's being done in the world is being done in American English. And so it's not the least bit unusual for you to be in a class and find out that half the people in the class are not really very interested in what you're talking about. They're interested in hearing you. They're interested in working on their English. So surprisingly enough, you may turn into an English teacher, even though you don't have to diagram sentences or parse verbs or do whatever, just by being there and speaking. So English is uh, the language that is used in much of the lecturing uh, teaching grants that we give. There are two basic exceptions to that rule. One, Latin America. Uh, the vast majority of awards in Latin America for teaching, I mean, you need to be fluent in Spanish <coughs> or Portuguese. Uh, and for Francophone Africa. Uh, the exception in Francophone Africa, apparently, is that you can teach American or English literature and you can do that in English. But I always caution people, because I'm a language person, I've studied lots of languages and I thoroughly enjoy it, even though I'm not particularly good at them, I still find them fascinating, 
is that I always think of the bread and bathroom issue. And that is, once you go out of your classroom, you're still probably going to be in a society that isn't necessarily fluent in English. And you may find that it will be very helpful to you to learn how to count and say where it is and can you call a policeman and something like that in other languages. And of course, many of our scholars come back after especially longer grants and have become what I like to refer to as mini experts. They've had an option to be exposed to a different culture and they've done exactly what makes us the happiest. And that is, they've gotten involved in that culture. They've learned some of the language. They've tried to make themselves as much at home as they possibly can, and they come back really fascinated by that culture, and they become more and more interested. They continue to do research and read about it and host people and so on and so forth. This is exactly what we love to have happen in Fulbright. So even though a language may not be required, you know, you may find, hopefully, that you will be curious enough to learn how to say some basic stuff. Uh, so anyway, language is not necessarily required, but it can be interesting. The other issue about language is if you are going to apply for a research grant, you must be able to demonstrate that you can conduct your research successfully. Because why would people give you X amount of money to send you to some place, and then you get off the airplane and go, oh wow, do you? wonder how I got a taxi cab, kind of thing. So uh, what you have to do is, it may be that that will be the language of the country. It may not. I oversaw a number of grants where people didn't speak very good Dutch or French, but they were doing medieval church records and their, their Latin was fluent. Turkey, grant uh, in Ladino, which was the language of the archives they were going to be using. France, lots of scientists when I was running that program, uh, who didn't speak, I know it's going to come as a shock to you, who didn't speak good French. Maybe didn't speak much French at all. But they would get a letter from the hosting institution that said it's okay that Joe doesn't speak French because we all speak English anyway, so what the heck. They got the grant. Joe can use translators. We've made arrangements for that, etc. So there are lots of ways to get around the language issue, but you must say something about how you will be successful. So just keep that in mind. We have awards every year between 125 to 140 countries. It depends on how everybody's playing in the sandbox that particular year as to how many countries show up. So 125 is bare minimum, 140 something is probably maximum. It depends year to year. Uh, and those numbers go up and down because we open programs and we close programs. I was brought in as a Soviet expert. I started with a country. Uh, then after successfully destroying it, thank you very much, uh, I had 15 countries that I created programs in. So all of a sudden we went from one to 15. Uh, and then I had to close some of those. So then all of a sudden we would have 14 for that particular country. So it comes, it comes and goes. So anyway, keep in mind that the numbers of countries vary year to year, the numbers of opportunities. In total, we give about 1,100 grants a year with all those special short programs, et cetera. As I've mentioned, the core program, which is the largest and the original program, uh, amounts to more than 800 grants for American scholars every year. So these are fairly sizable programs. Who, to whom do they go? Faculty, administrators, professionals, as I've already mentioned. Uh, the core grants, uh, we call them core grants now, we finally had to come up with a name uh, because they were the Fulbright grants and they had always been the Fulbright grants but then we had all these other Fulbright programs and so a couple of years ago we decided to uh, rechristen them as the core program. So the core program is still the biggest and the longest of the, of the programs that we give and the shorter programs run from two to six weeks, the ones that I mentioned very rapidly a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it's unfortunate that there's so much light because this is such a luridly colored uh, graph. I was like, people to see it. It's really frightening. Uh, but anyway, what it's supposed to, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, but thank you anyway. Um, what it basically points out that is about a third of all of our grants are for pure teaching. I, I slip up every so often and still refer to them as lecturing because that's what we used to call them. And then we found out from our younger employees that like a nebody refers to like a lecturing anymore. Hey, my God. So then they became teaching grants. But anyway, about a third of them are pure teaching. About another third are what we call teaching slash research, which means you apply to do both. And you have exactly the same page space to do that as you would to apply for a teaching grant. And then about a quarter of our grants are pure, uh, pure research grants. That number has actually gone up over the years. 
uh, because originally it was uh, I, the belief was that if you conducted research, uh, you were apparently in a bunker the entire time and never talked to anybody, and then got on a plane and left again. But as everyone has come to realize, research is as collegial as teaching often is, and that it's very unusual for somebody to spend all of his or her time never talking to anybody in the country. So anyway, we have all of these opportunities. And then about 7% of the grants we give are these special programs, seminars, etc. Uh, most of our programs are country specific. And they're country specific because these grants originated from treaty obligations. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, there were lots and lots of specific treaty relationships between the United States and other countries. And senators and vice presidents and presidents would go on trips and they would always come out waving pieces of paper, look what we did, look what we did. You know, okay, we didn't get rid of nuclear weapons, we didn't do you know, a couple other things. But we made a relationship to exchange artists and educators and students. And so many of these programs originated as country-specific, treaty-related grants that were coming out of some sort of diplomatic effort. Those treaties basically don't exist anymore because everybody pretty much just said, yeah, we understand, we get it. But most of the, the vast majority of those 800 plus grants are going to be to a specific country or another. But there are multiple country opportunities that you need to be aware of because they are excellent. And I know that at least a, one of these has been used by a scholar from the University of Florida within the last five years. Because I checked and that was a special slide that I don't have anymore. So anyway, <clears throat> you'll have to trust me on this one. Um, what are they? Well, one of the most interesting is the Sub-Saharan African Regional Research Program. Uh, if you plan to do pure research in Sub-Saharan Africa, you apply for this program. Uh, there are plenty of programs in Sub-Saharan Africa that allow you to teach or do teaching and research that are country specific. But in order to do pure research, you accept in South Africa, don't you love this? I'm gonna be saying accept all afternoon. But anyway, except in South Africa. Um, if you wanna do pure research, you must apply through the regional program. And it gives you the option of going to as many as three different countries. So it gives you options that would not be available through a country program. Why is South Africa excluded? It's not because we don't like South Africa, but because South <coughs> Africa has teaching, teaching and research, and peer research. So they have their own peer research program. Nowhere else in Sub-Saharan Africa does. That's taken care of through this regional program. There's a very similar program through Middle East and North Africa program that we refer to as MENA, that's M-E-N-A with capital letters for Middle East North Africa. See, I told you I wouldn't have any secrets from you today. Uh, it's very similar, multi-country opportunities. The newest region or cone of the State Department, which is how they divide the world, and we divide the world the way they tell us to divide the world, is South and Central Asia. And that is starting with the Stans of Central Asia. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, India, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, that whole centralized chunk of Asia has a multi-country option as well. Two to three countries where you can conduct research. Some of those individual country programs will also have pure research options, unlike the Sub-Saharan African thing. But if you want to go to more than one, this is the program you apply for. Uh, there's also something uh, in Europe that uh, I used to run, and that's the European Union Affairs Program. It's a very interesting one to uh, conduct research on the EU. I will tell you that if you're interested in the EU awards, look very closely at this because it tends to be undersubscribed. And the EU is, making, is paying for almost the whole program. So if you want to conduct research in the EU, anywhere in the EU, about EU issues, etc., this is a great program to look into. As an historian, of course, I'm particularly fond of the Austrian-Hungarian program, uh, but I have to deny that I am trying to reestablish the Habsburg Empire. Although sometimes I wonder, it might not be a bad idea. You know, they really dressed nicely and they did all those nice big balls and things. Uh, but anyway, it requires you to do things like spend half your time in Vienna and half your time in Budapest. Right, that's a tragedy. Um, and finally, in the Western Hemisphere, we only have two regional programs left. If there are uh, funding cuts, regional programs traditionally get them first because they don't really have a particular country that sponsors them. So nobody's ambassador is gonna call up and say, how dare you take this program out? Because it's like, well, you might have wound up in my country, you might not have. 
Uh, and so regional programs are the ones that, that tend to get clobbered if something's going to get clobbered. Uh, but what we have left are both very interesting options. One is the Canada-Mexico North American Studies Program. It's a very interesting program. And then there's an environmental sciences program between Argentina and Uruguay. But those are the multi-country options. Otherwise, you're going to have to pick from this smorgasbord of 125 to 140 countries and apply for one of those countries. Are there any questions yet? I dare to ask. OK, good. Everybody, it's just after lunch. This is when I always taught at Indiana University. Oh, darn. Somebody stayed awake. Yes? So and, uh, we apply for multiple like research or research slash teaching, or do I have to apply for only one? Can you apply for multiple things or only one? Well, we're going to get there, but I'll tell you right now, you can only apply for one. So this is the hard part. Uh, by this point in the presentation, I have everyone worked into a frenzy uh, because I have so fascinated you with the options that you're wanting to know, well, will this guy ever shut up and tell me how to get an award? Okay, so we're going to go into the practical stuff right now. Every year, we do nothing on paper, basically, anymore, except some of those flyers that you saw outdoors. Uh, we used to produce 50,000 award catalogs every year. And so if you're breathing better, as far as I'm concerned, it's because of Fulbright. We're not chopping down trees the way we used to. Everything is on our website and is electronic. For the core competition, which is the largest of the competitions, we announce on the 1st of February every year for the following academic year. So Fulbright requires planning. This hopefully works to your benefit in the sense that there's a long time lag. Uh, but it also works against you because people are all constantly contacting me and saying, oh, I just got a sabbatical for next year. Uh, you know, which of the core programs can I apply for? And I go, well, uh, unfortunately, you're a year behind. So one of the things that you've got to be aware of is that Fulbright runs ahead. So right now, we're in the competition for academic year 12-13. Say it's later than you think. Um, what you do is you go online, either to this address, www.iie.org forward slash CIES, or you go to the easier address, it gets you to the same place, which is www.ciees.org. They'll both get you to exactly the same landing page. That's where you'll find our online award catalog, the thing that opens on the 1st of February, and the competition closes on the 1st of August. So we actually, we until last year, we opened our competition on the 1st of March to close on the 1st of August. We've moved it all up to give everybody an extra month uh, to the 1st of February. So this is supposed to be a good thing. Okay, trust me on that. Uh, but anyway, it will close on the 1st of August. The only exception to that is if the 1st of August falls on a weekend. It's always the following Monday. This year, it's Monday is the 1st of August again. Last year, it was the 2nd of August. The year before, it's the 3rd of August. Ugh. But one thing I can tell you is that faculty academics are no better than their students or taxpayers <laughs> uh, because they file at the very last minute. And two years ago, it took us five days to get the computer system restarted uh, because so many people dump their applications on Sunday night. Uh, so just for the heck of it, we did get them all back as far as we know. Just for the heck of it, you know, do it on like Friday or something as opposed to Sunday night or whatever, Monday night, whenever it comes, uh, because there's kind of a stampede at the last minute. You'll also find the application, which is the fill-in-the-blank application. I'll be quite honest with you, it's one that we don't like particularly, but we're stuck with it by contract until next year, and then we're probably going to ditch it. The reason I mention this is because the trick on that application is that you have to list your letters of reference twice. I have no idea why. That's an issue with Embark, and Embark won't change their application for us. So just keep in mind, if it looks like you have to do it twice, you really do. And there's not a thing I can do about it or anybody else at CIS can do about it. We've asked. So that's the trick to that one. Otherwise, it's very simple. It's fill in the blank. And Embark is used for lots of college applications and graduate school applications and this sort of thing. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll also find that online we've got lots of material. We've tried to clean it up over the years because we actually did a study. Of course, I was on that committee, as I've been on every committee, as you can imagine. And we actually printed off everything that we had as tips. 
and we had a stack of paper that was like this. You know, it looked like you know the, the majority of the Manhattan telephone directory, because over the years we had accreted hints, and they were done by various people. So they used different terminology and so on and so forth. And in trying to be helpful, we had created a phenomenal morass of information. So we cleaned it all up, tried to straighten it all out, get it much more streamlined. I hope you will find it useful. But there are all kinds of things. There are overviews and, and guides and frequently asked questions and tips and so on and so forth. So they're there. Look at them. Uh, please read the application. It's very simple. But just in case you weren't aware of this, academics are like everybody else. We're all overloaded with reading assignments. And we tend to go, OK, well, <laughs> I've got a PhD. I mean, like, how hard can this be? And so we go jumping into things, then suddenly find out we're in a mess. Uh, so at, at least look at these to get sort of familiar with what the advice is. It's very streamlined. It's very uh, Our website, of course, has the wonderful option to be updated on a regular basis. And it is, because sometimes awards get withdrawn in the middle of a competition. It happened two years ago with Ireland, because a number of the awards were being funded by institutions. And the institution suddenly found out the budget had collapsed. Of course, it didn't happen in America, thank heaven. Uh, and they decided they couldn't afford the awards, and so all of a sudden they disappeared. Uh, sometimes countries get added or awards get added. So anyway, this uh, catalog is updatable, and it's a wonderful thing to look at. Another thing that I started two years ago was webinars, and our, our colleagues at the uh, IIE had actually started webinars prior to us, and we both use them, and we do them the same way. Uh, we do them at different times. We do them on Wednesdays. Uh, two, uh, p.m. Eastern Time. And we start on the 1st of February and we go through the 1st of August and every Wednesday we have a webinar on uh, of, about that core program competition. Sometimes it's about how to fill out the application. Sometimes it's about how to do a project statement. Sometimes it's about options in East Asia. Sometimes it's about options in STEM fields. Uh, these are all listed on our home landing page and there is an archive. So if you do not uh, if you are not able to attend a webinar, go to the archive and you can open it up and you'll get the PowerPoint and the commentary. So these are not secret. They're there to help you. And the nice thing about it is people get to ask questions. And so what you'll find often is that the thing you were concerned about or thinking about may very well have been asked by somebody else. And it will have been answered in the course of the webinar. Uh, we have enough programs now that we also do some on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So things are getting very crowded. Uh, but anyway, it's all archived, usually within about two days. Uh, our webmaster is really good. He did the last one 10 minutes after it was over. It's like, he's getting better. Uh, and so just look there to see if there's something that might be of interest to you. And we have a monthly electronic publication called the Fulbright Scholar News that I just resurrected. Uh, and that's to give hints about here are programs that you might want to look at, here are things in the news, et cetera. Uh, we just had another Fulbrighter get a Pulitzer Prize this last week, and so we'll be mentioning Eric Foner, and so on and so forth. So we talked about Fulbrighters in the news, et cetera. And it's a nice little thing that you can sign up for, and I hope will be coming out every month. Ah, so much to do. Anyway, okay, so here's the issue. As I've already mentioned, thank you for your question. You have to apply for a single award. So out of all those opportunities, equal award, you have to apply for one of them. So how are you going to do this? Well, uh, there are a lot of ways to look at it. There are plenty of people who already know, I have to be in the Netherlands. That makes it really simple. Because you go onto our landing page, and there are a whole series of searchable categories. The second one is country. You hit this big, long list. Oh, it's a really long list. And you find Netherlands. That comes under N. I mention this because. When I first started, our catalog was printed, and the entire world was done alphabetically. And you would be astonished at how often I got a telephone call saying, I can't find Chile. Did you think of looking under C? That's the thing that looks like half of an O and follows B. Uh, it's kind of amazing sometimes how, you know, so if nothing else, think of your little, you know, A, B, C, D, G, M, song. Anyway, uh, this thing is all alphabetically organized. And so if you know you need to go to the Netherlands, go to N, click on Netherlands, and you'll get, first of all, a country overview that describes the program in general. 
You will then find the program staff who work with it, those people you can ask the questions of. You will then find an overview of benefits. Please always look at this because benefits also vary country by country, sometimes quite dramatically. So make sure you know what the benefits are. And then you will find a list of each of the award opportunities that the Netherlands has identified for us. And you can click on those and then get the details. And what will come up is the details of the award, then followed by the country overview, then followed by the program staff, then followed by the benefits. But we try to make sure that that information is available to you at all times so that you can constantly be refreshing it or looking at it. You don't have to jump back and forth. Anyway, that's how you use the catalog by country. So if you know what the country is, that makes it very simple. If you're interested in a world area, that's the first searchable thing. Those are the cones that I was talking about. They're organized by the cone by the State Department. You click on that and click on a world area, you'll get every country that's listed under that world area. There are other ways to do it. What about the activity? I know lots of people who say, you know, I want to go teach. Okay, great. There's another set of drop downs by activity. You hit that and you can find all of the teaching awards. It's under teaching. Uh, if you want just interested in doing research, you can look under research and you'll find all the research awards and then you can, you know, check each of those. They're a quarter of all the things that we offer. Research slash lecturing, etc. You can go by activity as well. And one of the nice things is you'll find that many countries have more than one activity associated with an award. To me, the best awards are, and there are lots of them, they'll say teaching, comma, research, comma, teaching, slash, research. That means what do you want to do? You pick it, and you tell us how you're going to accomplish whatever this, the one is that you pick. Some will say <coughs> teaching. That's it. Keep in mind that you may have a research agenda in that country, and it doesn't have a pure research award. This happens. Okay, they're lecturing, teaching, whoops, I did it, okay, oh my God. Uh, teaching opportunities, and that's all there is. Well, fine, would you like to teach there? You can teach, and then conduct research on the side, because by and large, unless they chain you to a desk, which has not happened in the entire time I've been here, uh, you will have free time, and you might even mention in your proposal, and when I'm not teaching, I would like to conduct research on, you know, Guy de Maupassant, or something like that. And everybody will say, oh good, I see that she, he, is going to be using uh, his or her time very well and they've got some other things to do. But keep in mind that you're proposing to be given an, uh, a grant for teaching. So what you want to do is focus on teaching because that's what you're getting the money for. But by adding that you have something else that you want to do, it makes you more interesting as a scholar and that's perfectly fine. But so anyway, there are several ways, uh, by the way, I love felines, to skin a cat. So there are various ways to use Fulbright to get to do things that you would like to do uh, without being dishonest, but finding that you have to do a slightly more circuitous route if that's all that's offered and you want to go there. Uh, how about, we've got some great indices. We track 46 disciplines every year. We've done this historically, and this is the only really straight line for a baseline for research that we can do is by disciplines because countries, as I've already mentioned, come and go. Awards change year to year. So it's very difficult to get any kind of research by country or by award because they move back and forth. Disciplines we always track. And so we track 46 basic disciplines. And there's a big drop down you can go to and say, okay, I'm in sociology. I will tell you right now, I always pick on sociology. I have no idea why. Although the, my high school sociology teacher was, oh, she was a but anyway, I'm interested in sociology. So I click on sociology, and I'm going to get every award that is named sociology, which is what we call a programmed award because it names a discipline, or that mentions in the description of subfields the word sociology. You'll find all of those together. And you can do them by chemistry, by biological sciences, by history, U.S., history, non-U.S., urban planning, etc. But you may not find an award programmed award that you're interested in in a country that you want to go to. Oh dear, what do you do then? Well, there's a way out of that. We have this year, I think it's 182 awards, and we've only got like 130 something countries, that are called all or multi-discipline awards. What does that mean? Multi-discipline awards are typically awards that have a mixture of opportunities. They sometimes may make sense. Uh, humanities and social science. Sometimes they don't. Tap dancing, 
brain surgery, American literature, <laughs> and fruit picking. Why they came up with these, I have no idea. But you can't stick them into a program to war because what would you call it? So that's called multidiscipline. The other option is all discipline awards. And most countries have those. And typically, we were able to get countries to put them into these awards into their programs because we kept saying, if you use nothing but programmed awards, how do you know what you're missing? There are lots of people out there in the United States who would love to be in this country who have some very interesting things to do, but you're not listing them in your program awards. So don't you want to at least know what people are interested in doing? The vast majority of countries have agreed, and that's what are called all discipline awards. And they typically mean, tickle my fancy, make a proposal, tell me what field you're in. You know, how do you want to define the program in this country? Make it, you know, make a good proposal, we're ready to rock and roll. So that's what all discipline awards are. There's nothing more prestigious in terms of a multidiscipline award or a, I mean, an all discipline award or a program award. And if things currently stand, our grants are about 50-50 now between program awards and all discipline awards. So all discipline awards, these are doors. These are just multiple kinds of doors to get you into the program. Some countries do not have all discipline awards. The most important one of those is the People's Republic of China. As you can probably suspect, the People's Republic of China just doesn't work that way. You know, make a proposal, what do you want to do? That's not how they do things. So that's going to be a program award, uh, or a set of program awards. But virtually every other country in the world has them, and if we've got 182 compared to 135 countries, that means that many countries have multiple all discipline opportunities. And that may be one is for lecturing, and another one will be for research, or so on and so forth. But keep in mind, uh, France is basically an all-disciplines research program. What do you want to do? Russia, basically an all-disciplines teaching, research, what do you want to do? Program. So there are lots of major programs, etc. You know, these are not confined to a certain part of the world or a certain kind of country, etc. These options exist all over the place. So there should be a way for you to find an option to use Fulbright uh, to your benefit. So please read the program, the award descriptions carefully because as I've mentioned to you, you have to apply for only one and it will be, it may give you lots of opportunities, it may not, it may be that this is a teaching award and it's in the spring and da 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 and that's what they wanted, so that's what you're gonna have to apply for. And if you don't match the award when you are reviewed by all these thousands of reviewers who look at your program, that's the first thing that they'll ask is, is there a match? And if there's not, then you're not gonna get a, you're not gonna get a grant. Because these awards are designed in country, and some of them look very much almost like job opportunities, and some of them are wide open. But remember, you have, there has to be a match between the award as described and what you're proposing to do. Uh, most people get this in those 18 plus years. I had a few uh, very interesting discussions with people who would make, uh, I learned an awful lot about my parentage and a whole bunch of other things because they wanted to apply to go to country X and there wasn't a ward that fit their, you know, their area of interest and they were angry at me. And so as I say, they had some really very pointed observations on me. And Lord knows some of them may have been true, but anyway, it didn't make any difference because they had to match the award, so keep that in mind. Uh, please always look at the stipend information. Fulbright Awards are typically not for placement salaries. And so we encourage hosting uh, home institutions to help you out, or sometimes people mix grants, you know, they have several grants at the same time, or they're on a sabbatical or whatever. But just always look at the stipend information. Because I've had some very odd questions from people who were already overseas who had signed a contract, etc who didn't seem to have ever looked at the stipend information, which I find quite peculiar. Um, but anyway, they did it. The country that pays best is, interestingly enough, the People's Republic of China. There's not a cent of Chinese money in it. It's all your taxpayer money. But of all of the programs, the PRC pays the best of any. Uh, so keep that in mind. And always, obviously, contact our program staff. And you can contact me. I no longer do specific country work, but I did it for 18 plus years answer lots of questions or I can direct you to the appropriate individuals to do so. What does an application look like? Oh yeah, I just said uh, the frenzy is building. I can tell you, leave it. Oh, looking at you, please wipe your chin. Thank you. 
Uh, there's an application form. That's that Embark thing with twice, you know, what are your, uh, what are your letters of reference? A project statement, we'll talk a little bit more about this. It's very important. It's where you make your case for what you want to do and why you should be getting an award. And you have exactly five pages to do it. You need an up-to-date CV or resume, whichever is appropriate. Reviewers use these very, very carefully. They read them very closely because this is your autobiographical information, basically. So as I always warn people, if you were born in a log cabin and had to walk 600 miles uphill to school every day and did your homework on the back of a shovel by fire, like that's fascinating, we'll have a cocktail party and talk about it. That's not going to be very helpful when you've only got five pages to make your case when you write about it. So all that sort of stuff would go into your CV somehow. I've never quite seen a CV that talked about the firelight, et cetera. But anyway, you never know. Organize it carefully. You know, education, where you've worked, things you've published, your inventions, your cases before the Supreme Court, uh, the, uh, the committees you've served on, the courses you've taught, et cetera. They all look different because they're all about individuals. But remember that reviewers look very, very closely at these documents because this is where they fill in the blanks about who you are, what your career and life has looked like. If you're going to apply for a teaching award, you're going to put in some sample syllabi. <clears throat> uh, typically, the syllabi are not so much. On Tuesday, we will read pages 76 to 123. Mm -hmm. And yes? Um, um, so I, just, just a reminder, we've got a panel. Yeah, okay, well, I didn't know if we were going to have a panel or not. Yeah. We oh, do yeah, have a panel yeah, here? Yeah. Oh, okay, super. I'm sorry, you're a panelist, I bet. Yes. I should have known. <laughs> okay, let me get through this really quickly. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, okay, and so uh, you're going to want to say something about how you teach, what the flow is, what the methodology is. Not so much about Susie and her red wagon on Tuesday yeah, the 18th. It's a teaching award. Exactly. For research awards, you're going to want to put in a basic bibliography about the research. It can't be exhaustive because it's not that long, but it proves that you're up to date. Uh, you will need three letters of reference. Uh, for a pure research award, they should just be straight letters of reference. For a teaching award, one of those should be specifically about you as a teacher. So it should come from someone who can evaluate you as a classroom presence. So keep in mind that one of those should be a teaching letter. Uh, with this current application, we can't indicate one of those specifically as a teaching letter, you have to indicate it. We used to be able to, but this will not allow us. And then finally, you may have supplemental materials. You may need a letter of invitation. A program will tell you if you need a letter from a hosting institution. Uh, that, you know, you could talk about that with the program officer. There are lots of ways to find it, and I don't want to interfere anymore with the panel type thing. Thank you, Kim. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you may need a language report. If you have to prove that you can conduct the research and do the teaching or whatever, if you don't have necessarily you know, native skills or whatever, you may need a language report. In some fields, people will put in additional materials, and that will include samples of their work. So typically, historians don't do that. Physicists don't do that. Urban planners might. Artists might. Uh, creative writers might. Poets might. So they're putting in samples of what they do, what their product looks like. Finally, very quickly, believe it or not, the project statement. Five pages. You make your case, you introduce yourself. Why am I going to this country? And always remember, you need to say something about why am I going to this country? Because these are country-specific awards, and if you don't indicate that you have a real reason to be there, people, especially overseas, will not be very impressed by it. And neither will Americans, usually. So why do you want to be there? So my basic rule is think of these five pages as who, what, when, where, why important. Sounds like an identification question that you give your students. Who are you? You can say it in two sentences because your CV will tell you mostly about who you are. What do you want to do? Where do you want to do it? Why do you want to do it? And always keep this part in mind. It's unique to Fulbright oftentimes, and that is what is the outcome? What do you expect to come out of this? What are you going to get out of it? What are they going to get out of it? What is your home institution like to get out of it? A very important piece of Fulbright that's unlike many other kinds of applications for grants. So, I think that pretty much takes care of it. Why don't we give a round of applause? Can I ask the panel members to come forward, please? Yes.
less than a month ago, yep. we found out that he is going to be one of our new Fulbright scholars. So he is fresh through this process. And then Ryan, I have a pleasure to meet you. And Ryan, I assume that you're with anthropology. Um, I was. You're I'm teaching anthropology. Okay. I'm now with the, the Department of Health and Public Policy. Okay, very good. And Ryan uh, visited uh, Switzerland for this Fulbright training. So I'll let you guys go ahead and get started. If you just want to talk about maybe a little bit about uh, your projects and sort of your initial impressions with, uh, with, with the application process. Okay. Um, well, for me, I'm here as kind of the example of uh, if at first you don't succeed. I'm a two-time applicant. Uh, I applied last year and did not get it. Um, this year, after a year of uh, refining, narrowing my focus, and really using that time to, to get ABD and to become a candidate and do all these things on the process, um, this year I actually was accepted and I'm looking forward to leaving in September to do my dissertation research. So, uh, um, kind of the, the things on my mind that it really in this process, is, it is, it, it's something that my advisor pushed me to very early when I arrived. Think about this, think about this, think about this. Um, took a kind of a long-term strategy. First, I applied for FLASs to go overseas for summer uh, language research. But then while I'm there, mornings were check, check, check. Afternoons were networking. We're going finding archives, which I want to go back to. Um, finding people who would write that letter of affiliation. Um, you know, my letter of affiliation came from someone who's a Canadian who's working in the Czech Republic, and he's had uh, Fulbright students before, so I found out he had a track record, I found out that he's had students accepted, and I was able to use him as that affiliation. And then also he set up the networking for me to go see actual Czech national professors and line up uh, future affiliations with them. And so it's kind of a, it's been a good bridge to get into that community and now have a chance to work with it. Uh, well, I'd say I, I share with Reed the fact that uh, it took me also two tries to get through the, the Fulbright. Um, I did this for my dissertation research in medical anthropology. I was in Switzerland in 2005 and 2006. And for me, the big difference between my first application, which was rejected, and the second one, which got through, uh, there were two. Uh, one was the language requirement. Um, it, I found it extremely helpful to have gone over the year prior to do a language program. Um, I lived in Annecy, France for a year, I'm, I'm sorry, for a month. Um, and at the time I also, I did my work in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, I went over to Geneva, I met my, my future sponsor, I checked out the facilities, the hospitals, the clinics that I was gonna be working in, and that really helped me kind of establish my affiliation. Uh, prior to that, I'd only been in email correspondence with him, which is fine, and I know that that works, but. But really, for me, that that was that was really what uh, strengthened my application for the for the uh, subsequent year. Um, so I actually, uh, as a graduate student, I actually took some undergrad French classes. Um, I highly encourage that if if you feel like that's one of the weaknesses on your application, um, there's nothing wrong with with joining some of the undergrads again, um, and then of course going over for about a month and doing some immersion was was extremely important. Um, having gone through the process, I'd say that, um, well, I guess it's about, it's about five years out now, but this was definitely, my year in Switzerland was, was by far the most challenging and the most rewarding thing I've done in my life today. Um, it was extremely challenging, more challenging than the application process itself. Um, you know, immersing myself in a new culture, trying to learn a new language, and at the same time trying to do my research. It took me about three months, three to four months, of just living there, um, learning the culture, learning the language, before I felt com comfortable enough to actually do my research, do the qualitative interviews that I needed to do. Um, I was working in soup kitchens, I was working on the streets, so I also had the challenge of having to deal with people speaking in a vernacular I wasn't familiar with. Um, the French you learn here at UF is not the French that you're going to learn over here. Um, so, yeah, it was a fantastic experience, uh, the experience of my life. Anna, would you like to? Yeah, um, my name is Anna Brodrick, and I'm a PhD in anthropology. And I just actually found out on Tuesday that I was awarded a public policy initiative grant to um, conduct my research on development policy in Mexico, um, specifically in Yucatan. 
Um, so I have kind of a different perspective, um, having not done that research yet. But I guess the way that um, that I applied for the the, um, the Fulbright was that uh, I'm, I've always been very interested in um, making relationships with people overseas and, and increasing mutual understanding and, and interacting with people. And that's one of the main missions of the Fulbright. And what I've been told was that my application was strong because I, I was so interested in that and I made that very clear in my application. Um, and had made uh, direct contacts with people that I was going to be working with and had them write a recommendation letter for me to come over and do my, my research. Um, so that helped a lot to have their perspective and say, this is somebody we want to communicate with more. So I guess if I was going to give one recommendation on how to improve your, um, your application, then um, I would agree with you and just say, it's, it's so much better to go and, and get that personal you know, interaction with people um, so that they can speak on your behalf specifically about their interaction with you. Um, I know that's not always possible, so sometimes you do have to start out with email. Um, another way, I was actually, the way that I met the people in Mexico that I'd be working with was that I was a TA on a study abroad program in Mexico and had done my, my master's research in Peru. So it was kind of a first time for me and um, I was learning to navigate the Mexican culture compared to Peruvian culture and everything, but um, I just went and knocked on doors and, and asked, you know, told people what I was interested in researching and they kind of opened me, like welcomed me with open arms. Um, so, and I, again, they were instrumental in me actually getting the Fulbright from what I've been told. So, um, yeah, and I should apologize for being late. I was just defending my calls. So, I'm officially a PhD candidate now. Whereas when I was yeah. <laughs> And as is the Fulbright, and one thing that I read online was there will be so many times where you're like, oh my gosh, how many more steps can there possibly be in this? And when is this process going to be over? Stick with it because it's worth it. So, thank you. All right, so we have two brand new scholars, one experienced scholar here. And I'd love to open it up to some questions. Uh, did your applications change fundamentally from the denial to the, was it the same general idea? Just uh, my proposal changed quite a bit. Um, my advisor was kind of, not to, you know, he'd have been great, but he's like, I'll just resend it. Um, instead, I actually went to some workshops to try and rewrite it, got as much help and as many people to read it as I could. And also that year, my research had really actually given me more focus, allowed me to kind of say, this is exactly now. It was a little more vague at the beginning. It became much more precise. This is what I need to see when I go, when I go over so that's kind of how it, it, the project was the same, the title was the same, but it was approached a little differently. I had a very similar experience. Um, the, the theme of the, of the research was more or less the same. I'm looking at the relationship among stigma, poverty, and mental health. But my first time around, I didn't have as, as firm, the research questions weren't, weren't really con as concrete as, as probably they would have liked to have been. Um, I think a huge difference for me was between the time of my first application and my second application, um, I took a research design class, or you know, research methodology class. Um, and, and those of us in the research fields, uh, in, in the science fields, pretty much you know, you're always gonna have that class there. Sometimes you may have to go to a different department for it, but it, um, it was incredibly useful for me. Um, I think that bolstered my application more than anything else. Let me just say very quickly that I work with uh, scholars, with your professors, uh, with Fulbright. And I very strongly recommend that you have other people read your application. I, read, I recommend that to scholars, and I think, frankly, they're even more reluctant on average to have other people read their material before they submit it because they're already convinced that they know all the answers. But the fact of the matter is having reviewers look at it and say, but I don't get this. Why does this relate to this and so on and so forth? It's very, very helpful. So get people to read it. And, and even some people that might not be in the particular field and, um, and the focus of the project. So that if someone who's not in your particular field, if they can pick up that project and read it and understand what you're talking about, uh, that's very important because not everyone that reads your applications throughout this very prolonged process is necessarily going to be in your specific field. Uh, they're going to be educated individuals. Um, so you don't want to give them something that's so loaded with jargon that they, they don't understand what's going on. So it's not a bad idea to have someone who's not necessarily in the same field take a look at it and say, yeah, I get what you're, I get where you're going. I took mine to an African and I studied 
medieval Czech religion. And so there that was, go. there were some big steps there to, where she had no idea what I was talking about, where my advisor, like myself, just assumes everybody should know this. So that helped quite a bit. been a while for me, I can't remember. The, the, the person I met in my host country was my sponsor, and yeah, he did write a recommendation, but I think that's different from the three academic recommendations that you might need from, from the school here. Um, Is Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And what, actually, the, um, one, of the, one of the recommendations that I had that was, I don't know if they, did they have to be academic, or could they be academic and professional? They can be academic and professional. Okay, so I had one of my, um, one of my actual recommendation letters was there, and then I had a letter of affiliation from the government office that I'll be working with, and then a letter of affiliation from the university that I'll be working with. If you can't afford to actually go to the country, it's a little daunting as far as making those connections go, and I'm just wondering, can you have a successful application if you don't have those face-to-face -face encounters? I don't know anybody. I don't know. You guys have them, so maybe you can. Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, you, there's an awful lot. You know, it's really nice, as, as everyone has said, to have this face-to-face -face encounter, but you can, you can certainly get a letter of affiliation um, on the basis of sharing and, and, and sharing an email conversation uh, with, with an individual. Um, this is why it's so important to have that, that statement of purpose and that personal statement available to send to them. If you're going to ask them to do something and work with you on a project, they certainly need to know exactly what the project is. Um, it's not unheard of for people to get letters of invitation from individuals uh, saying, yeah, you know, if you get the award, I'd, I'd be willing to work with you. I'd encourage you, though, because I've never paid for a trip to Europe. Um, there, there's plenty of short term, there's plenty of things to apply. You just have to have the res find the resources and find how to do it. And I might be in a different, and maybe I'm not, but I, mean, I would be going to do like a novel and it wouldn't be um, something academic, and maybe there's money for that out there as well, but it might be tricky. Yeah, there must be. And if not, I mean, it, it depends on how long you have before, like, are, are you going to apply for it this coming year? Ideally, but. Um, to me, I think, um, which, uh, you know, I've been on study abroad programs and, and I'm an anthropologist, but I can't emphasize enough how worth the money it is. So even if you do have to fund your own trip or, or borrow money from your parents or take out a loan to do it, it's so worth it. And especially if, you're, if you need that contact, I mean, that just gives you more reason. But to me, that's, that's worth it to take out a loan because it's, it's so fundamental, just international travel in general. But Thank you. Yeah, it's Maybe that. Many of the applicants I've worked with have kind of said that, that that affiliation often can be the, the most time consuming and the most difficult thing to, to get set up. So it's good that you're thinking about it now. And so sometimes it takes a while to come up. Um, Jessica, you talked about the previous international experience before, and I was just wondering from all of you what you, where you had gone specifically, and what international experience you had prior to this, and how that helped you with your application. Well, um, I had only been overseas once prior to, to living in Switzerland, and that was for the month that I spent in Annecy for a, for a language school. Um, prior to that, I did live in Canada, which was, which was very helpful for me in high school. Uh, they forced us to take French. Um, of course, I, uh, you know, I wasn't so invested in French at the time. So, but, but in all honesty, it was, it was helpful for me, I think, to have had that experience. Um, you know, living in Canada, and also definitely that month in, in France. For me, um, my whole field of study came out of first a semester abroad as an undergraduate. So I jumped on that first chance, spent half a semester in the Czech Republic and half a semester in Greece, and that little project I did for that became my honors project, which became my master's thesis, which became, you know, I was now turning in my dissertation. Um, over that time, though, I've also lived in the Slovak Republic for two years, which, you know, thank goodness the Czechs are across that little border because the Slovaks still consider them, you know, they, they used to be one country, now they're two, which is great for me. Um, you know, and, but then also class and, and so forth. So 
I've had quite a bit, and just, you know, I wish I didn't lose most of my language training every time I come back for a year, but, yeah. uh, but I made quite a few trips. And my international experience came from, um, I learned Spanish in high school, and like you said, it's totally different when you're learning it in, in classes, and so um, I almost joined the Peace Corps, my parents kind of encouraged me to go traveling instead, and so I did a lot of backpacking in um, South America and in Spain and a couple other places. And had done a study abroad in Australia, but hadn't spent a whole lot of time in um, in Mexico. And so I think that's why I qualified to go to Mexico was because I hadn't spent over a year there. Um, that might you might know more about the stipulation on if there's a, if you've been there for more than a year, then you should you should try to apply for a full right there. Um. <laughs> I have a dirty question about money. Uh, in approaching uh, a host or an affiliate, how do you? approach dealing with money because um, I've had one friend who went to India and uh, there was a host institution that said, oh sure, Fulbright, yeah, we'll take you. Um, but they, it wound up that they didn't follow through with their end of the deal. I may have the story wrong, but they were really interested in the Fulbright money. So how do you approach an affiliate who uh, may not necessarily be affiliated already with Fulbright in terms of money? Well, um, what I would do is I would wait and see if they're looking for a looking for money out of me. And if that's the case, then I probably would go to the program manager for the country in New York and say, this is where I want to apply, this is the institution I've gotten in touch with, and this is what they're looking for. Um, it's, it's unusual for applicants to be asked to fund. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily unheard of, but it's unusual okay. for applicants to have to pay something if there's any sort of payment, it's usually very nominal for space or for materials or things. Um, but if you feel um, if you feel leery about it, I would uh, I would get in touch with with the IIE program manager and just say you know listen this is the institution the country this is you know, what they're looking for. Um, most of the time, students are not are not um, are not charged. Um, could somebody speak about the the English teaching because it seems to me that there's a little bit less kind of creativity and involved. I mean, I just don't know what, how you distinguish yourself in trying to teach English rather than, you know, proposing a research project. Well, I mean, it's, um, there are a couple of things that you want to talk about. You want to talk about why are you applying for an English teaching assistant? Um, what do you hope to contribute to it? Um, what tool set that you, do you have um, that you can bring into the classroom to incorporate into English conversation. Um, uh, how does this um, experience relate to any future career goals you may have? Um, have you done anything similar here in the United States? Have you volunteered at a community center? You might be teaching English in a community center. Uh, but probably most important is, is why have you selected a particular country? What, it, what, what intrigues you about having the opportunity go to this particular country? What intrigues you about the people, the culture, the language? Um, what are you going to do in your free time? You're only going to be working about 20 hours a week. Um, so you're going to have a lot, quite a bit of free time. What would you like to do in your free time? Would you like to do some language? Would you like to take some intensive language? Um, would you like to do some coursework at a, at a, at a host country college or university? Um, the main focus of that one page um, is on why I'm applying for that English teaching assistantship and what I'm going to bring to it, what I'm going to get out of it, and why I've selected a particular country. And then I'm maybe going to do one or two paragraphs on what I'm going to do in my free time. And in, those, in that one or two paragraphs about what I'm going to be doing in my free time, I'm going to be very general, very, very general in the plans that I, that, that I lay out don't know where you're going to be assigned. So if I'm applying to Spain, I'm definitely not going to say that I want to go to the University of Granada, because there may not be any English teaching assistantship opportunities in Granada that year, and it could put the kibosh on my application. Uh, but if I just say, you know, I'd like to do a take some courses at a university, great, and then what people will do is try to set you up in a university town, try to accommodate what you would like to do Now, this is general to English teaching assistantships. 
There are, however, some countries in the world where it is not advisable to propose an ancillary project. And once again, this is not a Fulbright issue, it's an issue with the host country. Generally speaking, this is much more prevalent in the Asia Pacific region than in any of the other world regions. If I was applying for an English teaching assistantship to Indonesia, I would not talk about any sort of independent research I'm going to be doing in my free time. The Indonesians are very touchy about that. The Indonesian government is very touchy about that. And there's a very, a, a very formalized process uh, in Indonesia for applying for research clearance. Foreigners applying for research clearance. So um, Europe, Central and South America, I wouldn't worry too much about proposing an alternate uh, an ancillary project, especially if it's just going to be language, intensive language study. Uh, in Africa, I might take a look at the country summary and see if there's any sort of formalized research clearance procedure, and then talk to Jermaine Jones, who's the program manager, to see how advisable it might be uh, to describe an ancillary project if I want to go to Cameroon or Rwanda. And if I'm thinking about one of the countries in the Asia Pacific region, I talk to Jonathan Akeley about how advisable that um, project might be. One thing I wanted to mention just quickly about the English teaching assistantship. Um, we have a great resource here at UF called the English Language Institute. It's run out of Norman Hall, and it's for students, primarily international students, that are coming here that enroll in the ELI either prior to beginning. Um, I'm married. <laughs> and Congratulations. I would, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I, I would want to take my husband with me. <laughs> I don't know if that's an obvious statement or, or not, but I wonder um, how, if that would be a problem or what kind of um, support he would have because he doesn't speak the language at all. <laughs> okay. Well, um, there are a number of countries, not all, but there are a number of countries that will provide an increase in the monthly living stipend should a dependent accompany you. Okay. And be with you at least 80% of the time while you're abroad. If a dependent allowance is provided to that particular country, you'll find it in that individual country summary. Okay. It'll say dependent allowance is provided, or it, will, it might also say dependent allowance is not provided. Because there are a number of countries where it is not provided. But what the student program absolutely does not provide is dependent travel or dependent insurance. We're going to cover your round trip mm -hmm. transportation, but we're not going to cover any dependent travel. We're going to cover your supplementary health and accident insurance while you're abroad in your country of assignment. But we're not going to provide, I mean, the, the, the Fulbright program is not going to provide insurance okay. for your husband. So those are things you have to take into wondering, uh, you said that uh, teaching, if you go from teaching to research, but not the other way around. Correct. Does it help your application, or does it not necessarily matter if you've taught before when you go to apply for research? Does it, it's not going to affect it one way or the other. If anything, it's probably, depending upon how you track, mm -hmm. you know, you may have made some contacts in that country during the English teaching assistantship that may have helped you focus in your graduate work. Uh, the opportunity to have spent that academic year may have gotten you started on uh, a more intensive study of the language, which you might continue on. So, you know, it, it depends on how you're going to track it and, and how you're going to use it. Basically, do your first year to PhD student and then university. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
But now the, the important thing to remember, remember we, we talked earlier about previous experience? The important thing to, to keep in mind here is, is if I'm thinking about doing a graduate degree, there are an awful lot of one year taught masters, by the way, especially in Europe. And that's, you can do that on Fulbright, that'll work. But if I'm looking about, if I'm looking to do a multi-year graduate degree program abroad, I want to make sure that I apply to Fulbright for the first year of that program and then go about finding funding for the subsequent years. Because remember, we have this preference for people who have not been abroad in the previous academic year for six months or more doing graduate study research. So number one, it's going to put your application at a serious disadvantage if it doesn't make you ineligible. Take a look at the um, country summary for the United Kingdom, probably the most competitive country in the student program and maybe in the scholar program. It's one of the top. We get approximately 600 applications and there are 30 awards. So it's extremely competitive. But one of the eligi ineligibility requirements is that they will not consider an application from anyone who's already resident in the UK. And there are a couple of countries that are the same way. time, obviously not. <laughs> but can it happen? Of course. And it does happen every time. Always remember your competition is a moving target. Exactly. Every year it's a different set of people and they're going to bring different experiences <coughs> and different backgrounds to the table. So what may happen when you get turned out the first time uh, will off often uh, reflect as much who else was applying as what you were doing. But clearly everybody benefited from having a chance to go back and do it again. Uh, but you never, you could never predict that. That's part of the problem is you just don't know what the competition looks like and we don't know either until all the applications are in. So we can't tell you in process what's going on. You know, do you have this opportunity or that chance or whatever? We don't know either. So until it's all completed, uh, we can't predict it and neither can you. So you never quite know. language area study. Yeah. Is this a, an intense? Uh, I've actually done two. Um, one was at Indiana University, which has a fantastic um, Central Europe, Central Asia, and Arabic studies program um, that they literally have people who around the country who don't use this money from the government, that money's then given to them, and they can fund almost anybody who applies there for one of their languages. It's, there's very few people who don't get funding. Um, then when I came to UF, I applied for an international class to go to Prague for uh, eight weeks in the summer. Mm -hmm. And the first one at Indiana U was uh, there on campus? Yeah, it was. I applied directly to them, and they were able to, to fund me through a class. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was two class, and then or to the so two week, and then about two. eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and yours was about. Mine was about four weeks. Four I was weeks. there for a month, okay. and that was self-funded at the urging of one of my advisors. Um, no, I, I mean, for me it was a special case because I already knew that, that the language was one of the weaker parts of my application. Um, and so I, I, I was fortunate to have the funds to go over. Um, and you think this made a, a, a difference? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Very good, thank you. And there's some funny little requirements about spelling and French, right? Did you have to be at an advanced level? Yeah. Um, yeah French, was... French are very serious about their language. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many Americans that are learning Spanish just kind of in everyday life and stuff, and so they prefer you to have an above um, the hospitality level. Yeah. 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 If you look at and once again, if you look at that individual language requirement for all the Spanish-speaking countries, it's going to say proficiency in Spanish at the time of application, and that's basically because you are in comp competition with all those other people that we don't know about yet 
Uh, and all those other people have excellent Spanish skills. And once again, let's remember that Fulbright is more than educational, it's cultural. We're looking for effective communicators. How do you communicate with language? degree or its equivalent. But you have to make a case for why you've decided to totally shift gears now. If I have my degree in anthropology and I decide I want to go to Italy and paint, well why? I mean, you know, why did you take four years out of your life to become an anthropologist? So I have to make the argument for why, how, how this, is, this is part of my trajectory. And, and why I've made this change. And then it has to be supported by the, the people that write your letters of recommendation. Um, are there certain countries or certain regions that are, you mentioned that the UK was very competitive, other ones that are just insanely competitive, or more so than others? Actually, if you, if you go on our website and go to the resources for applicants, we will give you the statistics by country and world region and show you the number of applications um, in comparison to the number of grants that were available. Um, the 2011-2012 stats will be up around May 1 when the competition opens. And the reason why we give you th that information is so that you can take a look at the relative severity of the individual country competitions. I think it works better for the people that are thinking about the English teaching assistantships. If I'm thinking about an English teaching assistantship to a Spanish-speaking country, um, I might want to, the, the stats for Argentina and Chile are really tough. But there aren't a lot of people that apply to Uruguay. So maybe I, you know, I'm really just looking for a Spanish-speaking country. Um, I, you can use the stats that way. I think it's a lot more effective for applicants for the English teaching assistantships than traditional study or research, because you, if that's what you're proposing, you really know where you want to go and what you want to do. Um, I'm interested in uh, Russian art song, and um, I wondered if, the um, Fulbright send you just to Western Russia, or if there are available, if there's possibility of going like to Siberia or East Russia, or if it's really localized to Western Russia. No, no, it's the whole the whole country. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is this performance? Is this a performance based project? Um, I haven't decided if I want to do performance or really focus on language. Um, okay. But either way, yeah. Uh -huh. Now the reason why I'm asking you is because if it's performance focused, then you're applying in the arts and we're going to want to hear, you're going to want to submit a CD of your singing. I'm a master's in voice right now, so that's okay. not a problem. All right, yeah. But what you might want to think about is applying in world music as opposed to traditional voice. Okay. Um, only because that's, that's a much more um, ethno music type. Uh, Russian art song is a little bit more ethno music than traditional yeah. opera. You know, Western classical music, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Everyone's still debating whether or not we can use world music and what does that mean? Yeah. As opposed to ethnomusicology. Oh, you know, I know. When you guys get it straightened <laughs> out, let me know. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing voice and music history, yeah. and so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, because the people, because we, they're going to be two very different types of review committees. Right. You're going to have one that's very classically focused, mm -hmm. and the other, which is going to be much more ethnic, ethno focused but yet still interested in performance-based projects as opposed to a traditional ethnomusicology committee which might be looking for things which are a little bit more academic. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering if our panelists or uh, speakers might say a word about the uh, question of sensitive research topics. Um, you know, whether, you know, obviously there's the list on the country profile of, of things that might not be good to study, uh, but I was wondering if you could think of um, Know, things that might be less defined might be very controversial, something like studying a state initiative um, um, and how you know applicants or negotiate that or how it, it might become an issue uh, in the review process. I don't know necessarily that it's an issue in the review process here in the United States. Right. Be more it becomes some it may become an issue once the application gets recommended and it's reviewed in the country. Um, I think what you have to do is you have to begin the discussion with 
people here, with your advisors here, who are working with you on the project, uh, talking to them about it, uh, seeing if there is any potential for political, social, cultural sensitivity. Um, I think you talk to the people in the host country with whom you're going to be working. They probably have a really good sense of what's going to be touchy. And um, you get their feedback on it. Once again, you're sharing these documents early on in the, in the process. Um, and, and then you have to be very careful about how you couch it, keeping in mind that there are going to be people who are going to be sensitive to some of these things. And you want to show that you have the tact and the maturity to go there as, as, a, as a researcher. You know, um, I'm not. I don't have a preconceived judgment. I'm just going here to look at this. I'd say that's very important. It's certainly something that comes up with scholar applications as well. And it's a wonderful exercise in your diplomatic skills mm -hmm. that you can get to the same point, but you oftentimes have to get there and be completely honest in a somewhat more circuitous or euphemistic fashion, whatever it is, as opposed to you know, and I'm going to do this because I already know that that's the case, and I'm going to come prove it sort of thing. And I'm going to show you how yeah. to do it. People have a tendency to get their backs a little arched at that point under any circumstances. Uh, and so especially if you have any reason to believe that a topic is sensitive, uh, then you want to think about how you phrase what it is that you want to do. I found myself having to uh, ultimately adapt my research project slightly after I arrived in um, because of uh, issues of, of health information privacy. This is, of course, a big issue in all Western countries. It's especially a big issue in Switzerland. They're very, very sensitive about health information. Um, the strange thing for me, of course, was my pro in my proposal, I was proposing to, for example, screen all my informants for depression using a, a in-field CSD depression scale. Um, that, that passed. That went through both committees. Um, but then once I got into the field, and of course I had to submit my protocol to the ethical committee there, that's when I got stopped. And they're like, no, we don't really want you to do this. This is, this is too much of an invasion of privacy. So I did have to adapt a little bit. I still ended up doing what I wanted to do, and I came back with a lot of really great data. I wrote a dissertation from it. But my original proposal, that part of it, uh, screening for depression, I ended up having to drop while I was in the field for those reasons. So you have to, you know, be if you're doing a research project like that, you have to kind of be a little bit flexible once you get there. For me, it came up in, in a lot of this pre working beforehand and preparing this with my advisor. I am taking a, a figure who's held up by the checks as the quintessential check, and I'm kind of comparing them with people who aren't check and saying, well, they've got a lot of comments. So it's it's something of taking a very national figure who even the first president of their country was a historian of this figure. <laughs> Um, and saying, no, I have something completely new to say about it. And so it's my advisor and I worked quite a bit together saying, okay, well, we're saying this, the historiography here is wrong. How do we not say it's wrong straight out? Because there's a long list of famous professors and historians who have said this, but I want to say something else. So it, there was a lot of work there. And part of that revision process and making it, you know, what are they going to see when I give them this? Um, one more practical concern. Uh, when you if, you, if you get accepted, if and when, um, do does Fulbright set up like where you're going to be living, or is that something that you that you yourself need to figure out? Like if you need to figure out who your affiliation is going to be, do you f need to find your own housing? Do you need to deal with all of that? Yes, you do. I mean, there is a, the chances are there isn't going to be an apartment waiting for you. Right. Is there someone but, who helps you the, find those either things? the Fulbright Commission or the American Embassy? Okay. in the country. They're used to dealing with incoming Fulbrighters, both at the scholar level and at the student level. Uh, so they can usually help you get settled into a moderately priced place to stay for, for, for when you first arrive. Right. And they can give you lists of people that have worked with Fulbrighters in the past okay. um, as far as, as um, finding your dates. Okay, because I know that there's like, Russia has you register each place that you're at. Every time you go on vacation, every time you do any of that, you have to tell the government where you are and how long you're going to be right. there and all that stuff. So I just wondered if there's someone uh, who helps one of that. The, one of the neat things about a lot of the, a lot of the Fulbright programs um, around the world is that prior to leaving, there's pre-departure orientations in Washington, D.C. Uh, okay. And it's a grant benefit. 
uh, so the State Department pays your travel and your per diem to come to Washington. Okay. And it's usually a three-day conference. And they do it, they bring together all of the students, the American students and the American scholars that are going abroad. Uh, so they have a chance to meet one another. Okay. Uh, and they do some very practical, you know, day-to-day -day living type sessions. And one of the things they talk about is, is housing. And, and you can, and they, they, they invite recently returned grantees both at the scholar and student level. Um, so those are the types of people that can really give you what, what it's like to find a flat, you know, that type of thing. Because I lived in Russia before, I just didn't have to do all of that stuff, so. Right. that English is the national language is a second language proficiency required. Not unless you need it for the project. What country are we talking about? I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it would depend on whether or not you need it for the project. Okay, now I could go to, I could be applying to the United Kingdom to do something in Chinese studies and I might need Mandarin, might, be, might need to be able to read Mandarin or something like that. So yeah, you know, then I would, then I would file uh, Make sure that I had a foreign language evaluation in Mandarin in my uh, in my application because it's relevant to the project, not necessarily relevant to the country where I'm preparing. Yeah. For all of you who are graduate students, I would just mention that when I did my PhD research, I was in Russia and I was working with a national minority on a topic that was 300 years old. I was thrown out of the archives by the police every time I showed up. <laughs> I was not allowed to travel to the region of the country. I had another backup plan, and I still got a distinction on my PhD. So always keep in mind, with Fulbright or anything else that you do, be as flexible as you possibly can, and as you're preparing, keep thinking, you know, what am I going to do if? Because there, you know, there could be a fire, there could be a flood, there could be a governmental change, there could be all kinds of things that happen, and you're still going to want to maximize the experience that you have and get what you need out of it. So always keep in mind that you need fallback positions in case something goes wrong. You know, a professor who's sponsoring you dies or gets in a messy divorce or, you know, commits murder or whatever. You never know. <laughs> People are very messy. Uh, and so you want to be successful. And so always keep in mind you want fallback positions no matter what happens. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's just conclude by uh, one again saying thank you uh, Dr. Sandin and I will be here uh, for the course of the summer. We would love to Also, my office is in the infirmary building, you know, part of the honors program. Oddly enough, yes, we are in the infirmary building, the third floor. But we have uh, some binders up there with some examples of personal statements, project proposals, that sort of thing. And those can be helpful to look at just to kind of get a feel for you know, what this type of writing is like. Again, I want to thank all of our, our speakers and our panelists today. We